Hello and welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Last time on Plugin Along, I spent some time fixing bugs in the Deed Tracker plugin, and this time I'll be starting a new plugin project, a plugin to help hunters track when their deadly decoy is going to explode. As always, feel free to jump into chat with your thoughts and questions, but in the meantime, let's get to it. Okay, just moving around some windows here. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so welcome to the three war statue area in Bree, where my hunter is ready to go. Now, if you are not familiar with it, the hunter's yellow line opens up a deadly decoy ability, where the hunter's decoy will explode after 15 seconds assuming it has not been defeated in the meantime. Uh, and on Treebeard, we were using that to great effect because the explosion damage from the Deadly Decoy seemed to bypass the damage reduction that is happening on Treeboard, Treebeard when you're doing uh, Deadly difficulty, um, well, any of the difficulties, but we've been doing Deadly or above. And so it got me to thinking, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, at least on the Hunter's computer, there was a pop-up similar to some uh, things we've seen for Minstrels uh, and other classes, if there was a pop-up that just said, hey, uh, here's how long you have until the thing explodes. Uh, and wouldn't it be even cooler if it could auto-detect if your decoy has been defeated uh, and just clear that? And I got inspiration from this idea. Oh, let me uh, pop this open here. Uh, from a plugin called Minstrel Buffs. So, Lotro Interface, Minstrel Buff. Well, that's fun. Sure, Minstrel Buff. There we go. So, Minstrel Buff, uh, when you are playing a minstrel, you have both ballads and anthems. Uh, ballads tend to last while you are in combat, plus a little extra, but anthems start out lasting for a minute, and you can boost that up with legacies uh, on legendary items, and I think there's a trait that will increase it by a few seconds as well. But it's very helpful to have a general sense of when they're going to expire, um, because that time can go from one minute up to uh, two minutes or beyond. And so what we see here is Minstrel Buff in action, where the Anthem of Courage, I'm going to say, um, is slowly ticking down. The Anthem of War just happened right before that screenshot happened. So its time bar is full. And those time bars are relative. If it was um, a one minute or a two minute time bar, the, the width of it isn't changing, just how long it takes for it to take down changes. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat if there is something like that for um, the hunter does the decoy? And then I was thinking, well, what about other traps? Uh, we've been doing the perfect picnic a lot, of course. Um, and so one of the things we like to do is have a hunter place traps uh, to try and get those bugs before they get to the picnic basket. Uh, but, you know, if you've set them out and a few seconds go by and no one's, no one's touched Penny the Pony and it's like, okay, I guess I'll go touch the Penny the Pony, how long do we have left on those traps? Uh, and I thought that might be a neat thing to track as well. And as far as I could tell, there weren't any existing plugins that did quite this uh, thing. Uh, there are certainly buff bars out there that will track debuffs on you, but as a hunter, you don't get a status effect when one of your traps or um, your, de your decoy goes out. What you do get are combat uh, not notifications. And so I thought we could maybe monitor the combat log and use that as a trigger for what this plugin would do. So that's the general overview of what we're looking at. Uh, if you have any thoughts on <laughs> whether that's a good strategy or not, go ahead and leave them in, uh, in the Twitch chat there. In the meantime, I'm going to get a drink. All right, Little Redhead says, I'm excited to put this one into play once it's ready. Yes, Little Redhead is a hunter that I frequently run around with, and uh, it, it's definitely going to come in handy, especially on Treebeard, but even just uh, all the time. Uh, one of those um, side effects of the Minstrel Buff plugin was I, I, by paying attention to the life cycle of ballads and anthems, it just made me a little bit more attentive to how the minstrel worked in general. And I'm hoping for those rare times when I play a hunter or for anyone else, uh, that the same thing might be true where I can just have a better um, heads up view of what's going on with traps, decoys, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, well, I think we're done with that minstrel buff there. Now, the 
way I started out was to go to Lotro Interface and do a quick search. Uh, there is a class specific category. Uh, and then underneath that, there's a Hunter category. So I just figured I'd go there. This is going to be a hunt, Hunter plugin. So if there's something that's already there, uh, maybe I don't even have to write a plugin. That's the easiest plugin to do is one that's already been done. Uh, in this case, we can see Hunter Focus, which we worked on here a little bit um, a few weeks ago uh, to fix a bug or two in that. And there's a few others that we can see last updated. Oh, that's cool. Passage was last updated 2021. Uh, and the other one was Barrage Timer. Now, Barrage Timer sounds cool. Uh, looks like it gives you a timer for the two buffs for Barrage. I'm curious if that wouldn't be kind of supplanted by some of the things buff bars could do now. Uh, but if you just want a dedicated thing and you don't want to uh, bring all that extra stuff in, cool, that might work. I don't know if it works or not. Uh, and then it looks like a um, French originated plugin for just your passage of X skill, passage of nature, passage of evil, and passage of men? I don't know. Um, cool, okay. Uh, neither of those do what we're talking about doing, so we're, we're good. <laughs> we're not gonna be reinventing the wheel here. All right. So the first thing, uh, when I think about doing a plugin like this is how am I going to know when the deadly decoy happens? Now, I already hinted, alluded to this before, hinted at this, is we probably get a combat notification. So that's the first thing I did just before the stream happened was I set up a couple of tabs. So um, when you look at your chat filters, there are three specific ones that say combat. Combat enemy, combat player, combat event. Now, I don't know what it's going to go into each of those three, but I imagine the combat player is stuff that I do and combat enemy is stuff that is done by um, opponents. Uh, I don't know what a combat event is. Maybe that's when you die. Um, is there anything else in here that seems like would be useful? No, nah, we'll just start with that. So uh, combat player, I'll go ahead and drag that out. Combat enemy, I'll drag that out. And finally combat event is sitting right here. So that'll let us get a, get a sense of what's happening. But sometimes it's really nice to see how these messages interweave. And you can do that with timestamps a little bit, but timestamps in chat only go down to the second. And so if you get two or three messages in quick succession, the um, chat timestamp that you uh, can see, do we see that? Yeah, we can see that right here. Um, you can see all of those happened at 51 and nine seconds. So if they weren't ordered the way they are, we wouldn't know which order they came in at. So it can be useful to go ahead and set up a tab Let's see, create a new tab, and we'll call that all combat. And we'll go ahead and redirect all three of the streams there. And that way, if we have a question about, well, which came first, this message or this message, uh, the all combat will go ahead and resolve that for us. Cool, all right. Uh, let's go ahead and see what happens. So I'm gonna summon out a deadly decoy. And we can see we got a combat player uh, message. Arda applied a benefit with the decoy on Arda. That was very nice of Arda. Now, what's interesting is there is, like I said, there's no effect up here. Um, you would think I should have a deadly decoy buff, buff or debuff or something, but no. Um, and also we can see that when the deadly decoy exploded, there was no additional chat message. So that's sort of our default state, is we know that the deadly decoy went out, and 15 seconds later, it explodes. OK, let's start taking some notes. Awesome. So, <laughs> oh, interesting. Thorolor says the skill might receive a cooldown reset event. That's uh, really interesting. I haven't worked with those <laughs> very much. Thorolor does emphasize might. So. Um, Let's take a few notes. Deadly decoy. Um, when placed, we get a combat player message. Now, something to watch out for is if you are looking for a specific message in chat, be aware that messages can change. If I do this enough times, I might critically succeed with the deadly decoy. Of course, I didn't do that there, but wouldn't that have been cool? 
Uh, let me place out some traps and see if I can critically succeed with one of those. Oh, there we go. So uh, we can see when I place triple trap, uh, that's actually a really useful way to trigger a critical success because you're going to do three of them. So you're rolling that random number generator three times. And we can see one of the three was a critical success. And we can also see that there's some color changing going on in this chat. And that's going to be something as well. Thurlor uh, calls out, if you're pressing chat, you also have the hassle of dealing with French and German. You absolutely do. And not only the basic message, but the critical success versions of the messages. That is absolutely true. Um, so we're going to set up the plugin so that it can be localized um, or, or uh, those strings can be translated. So we are going to localize the plugin so that those other strings can be uh, swapped in. But we might not bother to source those strings today. That could be a project for later. Once the plugin's working in English, swapping out those strings is hopefully pretty straightforward. Okay, um, so we can see we get a message when we send out the deadly decoy, and that message is probably going to alter between at least a, you know, applied a benefit and applied a critical benefit. Is it possible to super critically succeed? I don't know, we'll find out. Thurler points out that the combat analysis plugin's source code could be used as a reference for everything that can appear in combat logs. And this is uh, absolutely uh, true. Uh, for a first principles sort of thing, we'll uh, muddle around here a little bit, I think. But uh, if I get stuck on anything, I may, I may just uh, sneak a peek at what they've got going on over there. So we need a plugin. Uh, so, going back to some things that we've covered from previous streams, let's go ahead oh, and show my desktop. There we go. So, in Lord of the Rings Online, I'm going to go ahead and put this in plugins, cube plugins, and we need a name for it. This, we could be very uh, straightforward and call it the Deadly Decoy Countdown plugin. Um, but if we want to be a little bit more general, if we like that idea of maybe we can include traps, or maybe we can include other things, um, we could be a little bit more general. So I'm going to just start by calling it Hunter Assist, and we'll, we'll run from there. So every plugin needs uh, a dot plugin file. And by convention, though there's nothing that requires this, we're just going to call it the same thing, Hunter Assist dot plugin. Awesome. So what do we put in there? Well, the easiest thing is to just look at an existing one. So that's what I'm going to do here. Um, all right. So we have Hunter Assist plugin. We want to edit this. And we were just working with the opaque quest tracker plugin before. So we'll uh, go ahead and uh, copy that in there and change what is appropriate. So first of all, it's not the opaque quest tracker. It's the Hunter Assist. So we're just going to call it a plugin to track when a hunter's decoy expires. Awesome. And then finally, we'll need to change that package. Now, we don't need it to be in a package at all. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we do. I was thinking uh, the apartment. So cube plugins, um, hunter assist, and then the name of the main file uh, that we're, we're going to want to load. Uh, now. We can have it be main. We can have it be whatever we want. If we come in here, we can see uh, D tracker uses main.lua. Opaque quest tracker just used opaque quest tracker. There's no requirement that it be a specific thing. Um, but in this case, I think we'll go ahead and call it main. And that means in opaque quest, oops, sorry, in hunter assist, we're going to need a main.lua. <laughs> there are points out that um, we might just be uh, able to get away with a regular expression. We know the name of the current character, uh, and we know that we're looking for something like applied something, deadly decoy on something. Uh, let's take a look at that. So name of the character, applied a uh, something, benefit or a critical benefit, with deadly decoy on Arda. So we know almost everything that we want right there. And so if you haven't used regular expressions, uh, we might go ahead and get into that. Um, 
But the easiest thing to do is just do an exact, is this exactly what it is? Uh, so the more complicated but more flexible way is regular expressions. <laughs> Thriller says, Hunter Assist is kind of general, unless you intend to add a lot more features to it. Absolutely, it is kind of general. The good news, I don't have to, to finalize the name until uh, way later. Uh, but I, I did have that thought that if the combat log agrees, that uh, this could be both decoys and traps. And so um, if we have, oh, what is it? Um, so the traps and, do you uh, get the decoy always? Or is it just from trapper foes? Um, so it could be, you know, trapper assist or something, or hunter trapper assist. Like you could narrow it down a little bit, um, but the you know call it traps galore. <laughs> uh, Little redhead says hunter trap assist, trap timer assist. Yeah, naming things is hard. I, I'm going to push that off for now. Sometimes the name of the plugin or the project that you're working on kind of crystallizes as you go on. So the longer you can put off the uh, the finalization of the name, the easier it can get. The red head says, why limit to hunters? Maybe other classes have time traps too. Uh, excellent point. I don't, uh, I don't play a lot of classes other than minstrel and occasionally hunter. So uh, yeah, maybe that maybe it could be wider. My focus is, is I'm definitely going to be focused on the hunter aspect because that's the easiest thing for me to work on right now, uh, since I do have a level fifty hunter on Treebeard. <laughs> on extra dragon says stop with feature creep. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll just focus on the hunter decoy. Um, so we have our dot plugin file that we just cribbed from a different plugin. Super easy. Uh, and if we wanted to be able to easily unload just this plugin, uh, if we had a bunch of other plugins going, we could go ahead and add an apartment. In this case, I don't mind just hitting the unload all button because I'm not going to have a lot else up. Apparently, Thriller is not a fan of hunters. Um, oh, that's my, my notes of what's going on. Okay. So the next thing we need is to take a look at the main.lua. Now, Again, a lot of times if you're trying to remember uh, what this should look like, it can be very instructive to just look at a different one. So if we come into the opaque quest tracker, which we've done recently, oh, right, at the top we want to probably import some turbine stuff. So uh, import turbine, and then we can just do a turbine.shell.writeline. Uh, hunter assist loaded. Now, when you have more plugins under your belt, it can be uh, really nice to have a stable of, um, of helper files where you get a lot of functionality for free just because you're pulling in from the last thing you worked on. Uh, but in this case, I'm, I'm trying to focus on some basics. So uh, I'm not going to try to, to do that too much. Or when I do, I'll, I'll call out what I'm pulling in. Oh, hello, Onyx Dragon. You've always wanted to write plugins. Well, you are in the right place, and I'm glad you got a chance to join us. Okay, um, so remember, <laughs> it's behind my head, but there's a little uh, carrot uh, button that you can use to get to the plugin manager, or you can type slash plugins space manager. Uh, and remember that when you add or remove a plugin, you do need to hit that refresh button, and there we go, Hunter Assist. And if we load it, we can see Hunter Assist loaded. Could. Uh, everything is uh, connected right there. There's more discussion in chat about naming things. All right, um, cool. So we have the very bare bones of a plugin, which is the dot plugin file, and a dot Lua file that uh, Lotro can load. So that's the very start of it. If we wanted to be fancy, we could go ahead and have an icon. Now, there's two ways to get icons into Lotro plugins in general. One of them is to know the icon ID, and the other one is to just grab the image uh, from your Lotro client by doing a screen grab. That's a little bit easier, but it doesn't, um, it means that your icon won't change if Lotro. Uh, if the developers decide to redo that icon, or maybe they scale it up to higher resolution someday, fingers crossed, um, you're still using that old whatever size you grabbed version. So there are trade-offs, but on the, on the plus side, 
if you really like that version and, and if they change it someday to something you don't like, you can be like, no, retro uh, a decoy. Um, so one thing I like doing uh, is having a, an icon for the plugin. We can see right here we don't have one. Uh, well, what would that look like? What did we do for the opaque quest tracker? I cannot remember at all. It's been too long. Um, well, we would have seen it. There would have been an icon. All right, we did nothing because that kind of looks like the, uh, the back of it there. All right, let's go into the D tracker, which, oops, the D tracker dot plugin will have a, an image and we can go ahead and make use of that. Whoops. All right, sorry, I was in the wrong, right place. I just didn't realize it, hunter assist. So we wanna go ahead and add an image here. Use what now? Hmm. He's the hunter decoy icon. Well, yes. Um, I think that's a good idea. So, deadly decoy. So, in the hunter assist, we've just said it's going to go into a folder called resources. This is just a handy way to go ahead and uh, isolate things like images away from your code. Um, but you don't have to, you can, you can put it wherever you want. Lotro does not really care so much as that is a valid path within the plugins folder. Okay, and then finally we need a deadly decoy. So as we've talked about on previous ones, the in-game screenshot uh, utility also does some compression, some lossy compression, which uh, causes the pixels to get a little bit distorted. And so I like using an external uh, screen grabbing tool of some kind, uh, because if you do an in-game screenshot and then use those pixels, they're not gonna be one-to-one, -one. they'll be pretty close. And so if you use Windows, there's probably a snipping tool or something similar named. Uh, and when you use it, uh, it will freeze your uh, screen and then you can grab sections of it. Now, unfortunately, because of the way it works, you can't see it in action. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do new draw a rectangle around that uh, did the decoy, and it snips that into its own image. Great. And because I do not have the desire to be more fancy, I'm just gonna come into MS Paint and play around with this. Actually, I will have to be a little bit more fancy um, if Lotro requires a TNG. Or, what is it? A TGA, sorry. Okay, so this is just me uh, doing a poor man's cropping. Oh, interesting, that is bigger than I expected. Hmm, uh, Steady Eddie has put something in that uh, Mubot thinks is a URL. He says paint.net is a great lightweight alternative to paint. It is. Um, when I need to step up from paint, I just go straight to the GNU image manipulation program or GIMP, uh, and we, we'll, we might get there as well. My quick bar is zoomed, you are right. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, do what I should have come, uh, done instead and come on into the deadly decoy and get a better version. So what I was expecting is like most icons that it would be a 32 by 32 box. And so while you can stretch and shrink your toolbars, the version in the skills window should be a little bit more author authoritative. Hey, look at that. Awesome. So there is a handy reference out there on the forums about which file formats Lotro will support here. I'm gonna start by saving this as a um, PNG because I want the pixels as they are to start with. Well, that's the wrong place. All right, plug in, cube, hunter assist, resources, deadly decoy, dot PNG. There we go. Now, I'm guessing that won't work on the face of it, but we'll find out. Deadly decoy, dot PNG. It did not. All right, Third Lord does confirm it has to be JPEG or TGA. And if I want transparency, it has to be TGA. Um, since this one does not have any transparent corners, um, whoa, 
Excel, what are you doing? Um, I could I could get away with the JPEG, but I just don't like uh, the JPEG compression uh, nipping off pixels here and there. So I'm going to go ahead and start up the GNU image manipulation program. Like I said, it's the next step up, and it does know how to save uh, in the TGA file format. So export TGA, great. It'll ask you some questions. By default, uh, the bottom left seems to work just fine in Lotro. Uh, and there we go. So come back in, TGA, do a refresh. And I've done something wrong. I love it when I do something wrong. It means I get a chance to learn. What have I done? Did I misspell resources or something? I probably did. Well, we know that's right. Oh, did I save it? No. Yes. I saved it. Well, that's just not behaving the way I would like it to. Um, why are you not cooperating, plugin? Okay, well, that wasn't a hugely important thing. It was just something I thought would be a little cool feature. So I'm going to go ahead and circle back around to that while I mull that over in the back of my head. <laughs> the lower says, that is odd. I know. Um, it might be something as simple as just needing to log out and log back in, but it shouldn't be asterisk. <laughs> um, actually, you know what? Maybe that image is the wrong place. I bet it would be more helpful if it was under the information tag. Hey, there we go. Okay, so that was a, an example of me not actually paying attention to where it was in the previous one, although that's funny. Oh yeah, no, okay. Uh, I had seen that it was after a tag and I didn't, just didn't pay enough attention to what I was doing. Uh, so well, there we go. <laughs> Forward slashes are allowed, Thorlore, um, but the uh, it looks like Lotro is very picky about where that image tag ends up. All right, so we're done with that dot plugin file. We're done with most of this. Okay, so deadly decoy. So one of the things that when I was first poking around with this idea weeks ago was just let's set up a basic chat listener and see if we can convince ourselves that we can tell when we are have summoned out a decoy. Uh, should be pretty simple. We uh, we see that kind of chat monitoring monitoring all over the place, but I feel like it can be helpful to kind of cycle back to, to first principles and be like, okay, what does it take to do this? And what was the first thing I do? I go to the documentation. There we go. So uh, we've talked about before where you can find this, or you can find it on the um, Life Beyond the Shire uh, blog post from an uh, earlier uh, episode, or whatever we call these things. Um, but you can find this on the Lotro interface uh, wiki as well. So uh, lotrointerface.com slash wiki slash lotrointerface underscore wiki. Um, we'll have all of this uh, API reference as well. Uh, I just like the, uh, the layout of this one a little bit better for most things. Okay, so uh, we have turbine.chat. There's a chat class, and this class lets us do stuff. Cool, What's it let, let, what does it let us do? It lets us um, know when chat is received. All right, let's play around with that. Yeah, we can leave that. So if we are looking for turbine.chat.received, uh, we want to go ahead and say, uh, please call this function. Um, what does it look like? OK, neat. Sender args. Um, what is what are we going to do here? Um, we're going to be able to tell what the event sender was and what the event arguments are. Uh, this documentation does leave a little bit to be desired. Um, when in doubt, the forums do have some good examples of this as well. Let's see. The arguments will contain a combination of sender, a chat type, and the message itself. All right. Fair enough. 
Uh, one of the things I find really useful is a function that um, I've lifted from some source or another, which lets you just print out arbitrary Lua tables. And so this is an example of, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and grab that. So in deed tracker, I think I stuck it into general functions. It's a function called dump. Uh, now, if we wanted to, we could go through and kind of see how does this work. But for now, let's go ahead and, hmm. Hmm, Thurlor asked a question that I will get back to in just a moment. Um, and, Sorry, I was just mentally mulling over, if I send out a chat message, do I get a received on that chat message? And am I going to throw myself into an infinite loop? Um, let's find out. Okay. Uh, so if we do a tur turbine.shell.writeline um, of the dump of the sender, what happens? Uh, and let's go ahead and summon out that deadly decoy. Okay. What we see down here is a printout of that table. Now, the sender, as it turns out, is not super interesting. Uh, so let's go ahead and do the args instead. Well, and looks like my decoy just, just gave it the ghost. Awesome. So. Uh, what do we see here? We see that the, um, the args uh, include a message and a sender and a chat type. And we're going to be interested in several of those. Thurlor asked a question about, did I explain, uh, ever explain the difference between the Lewis syntax of object.function and object, <laughs> boy, it doesn't like that, uh, function. And I don't recall if I did, uh, but Lua in a bit of object orientedness, if you have some, um, an object that is acting like a class, I believe the colon one will implicitly pass up this parameter. Uh, the dot function I think does not get that. <laughs> Thurlora points out that the sender is always your character regardless of who actually sent it. Um, so it's kind of useless. Good, that was the one of the three that I wasn't planning on using. Renaissance Gaming asks, do you upload these videos, videos anywhere? They're available. Oh, Thurlow is answered. Thank you, Thurlow. Uh, in fact, let's see, Life Beyond the Shire. Uh, Life Beyond the Shire has some blog posts for some of the early episodes where, we're, where we were really digging into the fundamentals of it. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure I actually linked from these back to the YouTube video. That would have been nice. Uh, so that's a reminder for me to, to do that later. Uh, but on YouTube, if you search for plugging along, you will see uh, previous videos. Uh, and, and one of the things I do try to do is go back through and add some useful timestamps for what's going on in those. Well, let's not play that. That'll just be a recursive. <laughs> and Renaissance uh, Gaming asks, do you know of any Quest Tracker plugin? I only know the Deed Tracker plugin. A Quest Tracker plugin is something that uh, has been, the idea has been tossed around in my uh, gaming circle as well, because from a completionist standpoint, it sounds really cool. Uh, it's, it's made a little bit more challenging because of uh, repeatable quests, uh, task boards, all sorts of different things. But if you don't need it in-game, I do highly recommend the Lotro Companion desktop application. I'm gonna pull it up here in the background. Let's see, let me just do that, cool. So the Lotro Companion desktop app can extract information about your character. Uh, so for instance, if I go ahead and import from Lotro, go ahead and do that. It's going to check out what's going on with my Lotro client. And it's gonna take a few seconds to import all that information. And you can see one of the things that it's importing is not only deed status, but also quest status. Cool. 
Um, now, now that we have that, I can come in, Arda on Treebeard, cool, uh, can look at the quests. And this is a list of the 11,137 quests available and which ones are or are not done. And so if you wanted to go ahead and filter by, um, I know there's a region. Well, I'll have, I'll have to look at that later. Um, so if you wanted to filter by not started, uh, if you wanted to check out, um, can I sort by category? I can sort, awesome. Uh, so just scroll on down here to the Shire. Is it T? And there's a lot of quests. Okay, Kingstead. Which ones in the Kingstead have we not done? Uh, and so you can see what level they are. And so if there's a way to sort by region that I'm not seeing because I'm live here, uh, you could only have Kingstead and then sort by level or sort by name, whatever is easier for you. Um, so yeah, check it out. Uh, let me pull up the about page here. No, that's not the screen. Oh, about. Uh, this is the Lotro Companion. Uh, you can check it out. Um, Well, search for Lotro Companion and you'll find it. Um, one of the things I did was on uh, Life Beyond the Shire, there is, oops, sorry, uh, deed tracker dot life beyond the Shire. If I'm spelling that correctly, there is a uh, little get you started on how to uh, import deeds from there into the deed tracker plugin. Uh, and so, uh, as a handy dandy link for me to remember that that's at SourceForge. And so if you get to a page on SourceForge.net that looks like that, you're in the right place. There we go. <laughs> I made a Python script to pull stuff in from the wiki. That's awesome. Yes, and this may, this may be a useful thing because not only, oh no, stop. Cancel. Uh, not only is that all imported, but it's also saved off in a handy, friendly um, XML format. And so, let's see, user data maybe? Ah, hang on a sec. Um, dot Lotro Companion in your, if you're on Windows at least, in your home directory. Uh, dot Lotro Companion data, um, let's see, characters. That's probably the most recent one. And then quest status. So in this is just, here are the ones that you have made some progress on. And obviously that'll get longer and longer for more and more complete characters. Um, but you can then uh, try to make sense of, of which ones you still need. Uh, now, of course, these are using internal Lotro IDs for their keys, uh, but we can talk about that in more detail in a future video. Okay, this is excellent, thank you, uh, great questions. I'm gonna go ahead and close those down so they do not uh, distract me too much though. All right, and the resources, we don't need that. Okay, cool, so um, Thorlor was uh, talking about this notation here. In general, I tend to use the colon notation. I believe it will implicitly pass the this parameter uh, for uh, object-oriented style functions. Um, but beyond that, I kind of am not uh, really strongly versed in Lua, so I, I tend to imitate the style of whatever plugin I happen to be editing at the time, which makes it a little, little bit hard to, um, <laughs> to be starting from scratch, because then I have to remember, oh, what's the right syntax? Um, so, Yes, in general, I could probably be writing it like this as well. I don't know. Will that uh, will that work? Let's find out. Okay, and then no, it does not. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Excellent. Thurlor has put it into chat. Uh, object colon function abc is equivalent to object function object abc. Okay. Neat. Okay, so we have seen a couple of interesting things here. 
Well, that's so funny. I'm just getting everything, aren't I? Ah. Um, so one of the things uh, I'm noticing is when I do a combat thing, um, oh, I've got to unload and reload, otherwise it won't work. Excellent. When I get a combat message and then I spit it back out, the color of that message still comes through. And so there's some RGB color stuff going on here. And that makes me very interested. Also, I want to turn off world chat. So let's defeat two carbine with one projectile. So we can see in args that there is a chat type. And so that's what we want to do. So local chat type equals args dot chat type. In fact, that's probably so basic we don't even need to save it off as a local variable. Uh, but what we can do is say if that chat type equals something, then uh, go ahead and spit it out. Cool. Well, what are we going to look for? Uh, well, there's a chat type enumeration here. Let's go in there. So this is turbine dot chat type dot something. What do we have here? We have enemy combat. That sounds like a good one. Or um, what else do we have that says the word combat in it? Player combat. I like that. Or anything else? Combat, enemy combat, player combat, death. Death sounds great. We should know more about that. Turbine.chattype.death. Okay, then do stuff. Now, it might actually be useful to know which one of those it was. So local chat type equals and local chat message equals. Maybe. No, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, okay, so. If we come back in and load this plugin, then ideally what we're going to see is we're getting messages from one of those three channels uh, and not any of the other ones that I'm getting, world or um, trade or whatnot. Thurlor says, a trick you can use to remove colors without messing with the string parsing is to apply it to a label with set text and then get it with git text. That's a really good point because labels understand how to set text. Uh, and I think labels have to opt in or you have to opt them in to understanding HTML uh, or colors. Let's see. Or maybe they don't support it at all. I know there's some control out there that does support um, rich text style stuff with color. That's markup. That's what it is. Excellent. So if markup is not enabled, presumably the label still understands markup, but understands also that it shouldn't use it. So it can go ahead and strip it out. And that's actually a really nice technique because then all of the, the processing is on the Standing Stone uh, games side of things, or the turbine as the namespace is. It's on their side of things. So if they change the one, maybe they would also change the other. Um, <laughs> things can get out of sync though. Um, what I was really interested in doing though was seeing the underlying um, code that's going on. So how do you spit out code that changes the color in a way that you can see the code and not the color? Well, um, chances are good based on what I've seen before that it probably looks something like RGB equals, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Um, and then, let's see, benefit and then RGB. Maybe maybe something like that. <laughs> Onyx Dragon says, is there a get text raw sort of function? Uh, excellent question. I don't have a knowledgeable answer for that. I, I don't think that there's, there's a turbine or, or SSG supplied function to do 
that other than what Thurler just said, what Thurler, um, what that would look like is we could go ahead and have a, let's see, text, you know, get raw text equals turbine.ui.label. And I'm going to want to go ahead and import turbine.ui or, or that won't work. And the other thing I want to do is remind myself how to write stuff by looking at this. Let's see. Oops. So, label. Um, the things that we're looking at, uh, there's no new statement like you might have in uh, C Sharp, C++ style language, uh, but we do want it to look something like this. Oops. Awesome. And so what uh, Thurler was describing there is go ahead and do git raw text set text. Oops. Uh, and we know that that's coming in with args.message. And then we can also say local raw message equals git raw text. Now that does depend on what you mean by uh, raw text. If you mean all the characters, even the ones that specify a color, then hopefully we can come across that in a little bit. But if you just mean just the alphanumeric stuff and none of the, the uh, markup, then this, this would be that. Get text. Awesome. We'll come back to you, RGB tag. So um, let me go ahead and trigger that. Oh, hey, hang on a sec. Well, either I misunderstood something or, let's see, we set the text, we get the text. You know what, I didn't actually set markup and able to be false. I just assumed it would start that way. Always catches me off guard when the deadly decoy explodes, and you wouldn't think it should. All right, Thurlor, I'm gonna have to put a little a pin in that idea of stripping off of the label because I'm not seeing that working the way I was expecting it to. Okay, so we set the text, we get the text, we have the raw message. It needs to be enabled. Well, I envisioned it stripping the markup if I uh, did that. Ah, neat, okay. So wait, so if you have a label and you set it to markup enabled as true, then it loses the formatting. But if you set it markup to false, it keeps the formatting? That's delightful. Uh, delightfully counterintuitive. But um, I, I, I hear what you're saying because if markup's not enabled, then it just thinks the brackets are part of the text and it returns that. And then the um, the writing to the console function interprets that. And yeah, we're back exactly where we were. That's fun. Okay. Uh, so we can see we have a way to strip off the color. Uh, if we didn't want to strip off the color, then we could try to account for it. But uh, this is a handy way to just say, hey, color doesn't matter. I like it. Now, if I wanted to see what was going on under the covers, I could, instead of using that raw message, um, use a Python, sorry, a Lua loop. Oh my goodness. Uh, and neat, Stack Overflow. Let's look at it. Neat. Um, so, I am curious what happens if I just go ahead and spit out all the characters, but maybe with a space between them, maybe interfere with what's going on. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is say uh, local space message equals 
uh, that. And then we'll go ahead and just use this example from Stack Overflow, a very useful um, uh, Q&A website. Oh, sorry, arc stop message. Um, do end. Space message e uh, equals, um, well, we're going to concatenate here, and then a space, and then, oh, we can uh, do the character first. So uh, the substring uh, just gets a, a, a starting, from a starting character to a specific length. I'm sorry, from the starting character to an end character. Uh, so if we just use I for both, we should advance through the, the text one at a time. And you know what? We can spit out both of those. That sounds great. Let's actually turn that off because I want to see those colors. And let's see if I made any syntax errors. I did. Awesome. So what did I do? I am so addicted to semicolons, it's a problem. Okay, so uh, this is a really easy way to kind of bypass uh, Lotro's tendency to interpret uh, color statements as a color. If you just split them apart as spaces, Lotro's like, well, that doesn't look like um, a markup for uh, our purposes. So just let it on through. And so what we can see here is uh, it is indeed exactly that. Art applied a uh, bracket, um, angle bracket, uh, RGB equals uh, pound FFFF00, a nice hex code there, um, and then ends. And something I noticed with previous testing is critical benefit. Oh, we can actually see it up here. Critical benefit is a different color. That is uh, handy to remember exists, right? Like uh, you can't just always count on the color being the same. This is where Thurlow's method of just stripping the color, color off is really handy because then it doesn't matter what color it is, uh, you are going to account for it. I'm trying to get a critical benefit game. Oh well. So of course this is why I build de <laughs> debug uh, functions in where I can pretend like uh, certain text has come through chat that way you don't have to have the skill available. Uh, excellent, thanks, decoy. Uh, I don't know how well that explosion comes through, but it's fun. Okay, so under the covers, it's using HTML looking markup for color. Cool. And um, if we come back in and go ahead and do strip the raw and just go ahead and output it a third time. So we want argus.message. Awesome. So we can get it in all three forms. Okay. So we can see art applied a benefit, art applied a benefit, no markup, and art applied a benefit. What does the markup look like? Now, if Lotro is going to give up trying to have it be markup, then uh, with, with just spaces in between, that suggests that we might be able to do something with those angle brackets. Uh, if we really wanted to uh, to do this without all the spaces. That being said, I love Thurlor's system of just stripping off the colors. I think I'm just going to run with that. It'll make life a lot easier. So, okay. uh, that feels like something would be really useful as a function instead of having to remember to both set the text and get the text. Uh, and so let's make a function out of it. So function get raw text, and that's going to be not raw text. <laughs> uh, text with markup might be a, a more descriptive. And then we can do just that same thing we were doing right here, except we don't even need to apply that to a local variable. So we have the um, label for raw text. We get that message, and we can just return that right there. Excellent. Uh, 
So instead of doing the processing, we can do args.message. And that should still work the exact same way. Nope. Excellent. I didn't actually use the parameter that I so nicely passed to that function. Lovely. Oh, good. Critical benefit. We can see the text stripping or markup stripping worked great in that case as well, as we would expect. Now, all of this together is a great little package, but we kind of want to not be looking at that all the time. We don't want to accidentally change, maybe uh, set that to false. Everything will break. We'll be sad. So let's go ahead and put that else somewhere else. Ah, Renaissance Gaming says, been checking out the Lotro Companion app. How did I never know about this as a completionist? Amazing. Yeah, it's great and it's under active development. So I think there's a link to the uh, disc Discord um, chat server in the, the help about menu. So if you uh, want to go and say, oh my goodness, this is the best thing ever, I'm sure they'd love to hear. Okay, uh, so as I was saying, let, let's go ahead and pull this out somewhere so that we don't accidentally change it or do something weird with it. Uh, so let's go ahead and make a new file. Um, naming things is, is hard for me, but uh, we'll just call it uh, helper functions. Sure. And we'll put that there. Uh, and maybe even note, this label is for stripping markup. Do not touch. And stripping markup. Neat. Yeah. Oh, says utils.lua. Sure. Why not? Also, I probably shouldn't have a space in there. Um, okay, so we'll call it utils, love it. Remember that you do need to go ahead and import it. Uh, if one were to forget how to import a file, one can always look at a different plugin that does it. So for instance, in this case, when you import one of yours, uh, you're starting at the plugins directory. And so in this case, underneath that is cube plugins. And then where are we? Under assist. Excellent. And then utils. So two things to remember about the import statement. It uses uh, dot, uh, periods instead of slashes to separate paths. And you leave off the final dot Lua. That is implied in this case. Neat. In fact, let's put dump there too. We might come back uh, for that later. <laughs> Onyx Dragon has, has preempted me. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. Now, if anyone has questions about how this works, we could uh, kind of walk through it. But the great thing about a function like this is if you're only using it for debugging purposes and it seems to work, you know, it's about as far as we need to worry about it. Thurlor says there is also a way to detect the directory automatically. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is not as, as refined as it could be. Uh, in, in that in that sense. Okay, so we, what have we done? We've played around. We can detect when something is happening. Uh, let's maybe start uh, doing something about that. So we want to know function decoy um, deployed and That's fair, Thurlow, refined or obfuscated. You know, it maintainability is important. And if you can make something really complicated and still be maintaining it after however many months or years, like for instance, the reminders plugin, which is great, uh, then whatever it takes to make that easy to maintain is important. Uh, okay. So we have Local raw text equals, or let's call it text without markup equals, and then we've got get raw text, args.message. Great. We can probably stop looking at those messages. The space thing was interesting. We don't need it right now. 
Um, and then we don't need to be playing with that anymore. Great. Okay, so we have that. And the very basic thing is if text without markup equals something, then decoy deployed, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of the question is what are we looking at? We're looking at name of the player applied a benefit or a critical benefit with did the decoy on name of character. All right. Text we're looking for in English. Because that is important to remember, that is going to change. All right, so we know that's supposed to be player name. And we know that's supposed to be player name. And we know this might or might not happen. So, you know, this is a combat log. So there is a question of how specific do we need to be when we're checking for this. As Thoreau mentioned before, if we just search for benefit with deadly decoy uh, in the combat player log, maybe that's enough, right? Uh, so let's start with that and, and see how we feel about that. So we're going to get benefit with deadly decoy on blah. Neat. Now, one of the things that's going to play in our favor here is Lord of uh, Lotro, Lord of the Rings Online, unlike some other games, doesn't necessarily give you combat information about everyone. It tells you about things that happen to you and things uh, your opponents are doing, but it doesn't tell you what's happening from other members of your fellowship, your raid, your environment. And so if you have seven hunters and they all put out a decoy, I think you are uh, only going to see notice about yours. Now that's something that's pretty easy to test uh, if you had another hunter nearby, uh, but uh, and and we may do that a little bit just to to see. But that's sort of a standard double-edged sword when it comes to um, there's combat analysis plugins, but they can really only analyze what you're doing. They can't do a good comparison of what uh, how you did compared to others. And that's something I've seen. Um, you have a little bit more power in for games like World of Warcraft, or at least a decade ago, it was possible to uh, try to make a combat analysis that would compare you to other people. Now, you had the other problem where there were so many messages coming through, you might not process them all, but you could at least try. Okay, um, that being said, let's go ahead and start putting together a list of things that we're looking for. So uh, let's see, we're looking for decoy, decoy deploy message equals that. Nope, that. So if we find that, oh, actually, let's call it a, a message fragment. If we find that in the uh, message, then we can assume we have deployed a decoy. And we'll even say something, turbine, dot shell dot right line so we can spit out a message you deployed a decoy you awesome hunter you hmm. the bar says that once upon a time Lotra did give you the combat messages for everyone um, and that got turned off. And I can only assume there were some performance issues with that much data coming across. Okay, so in Lua, there are a couple of ways to figure out if you have a, a string that matches inside another string. If you get how to do that, hand it in the internet, Lua, find text in string. How do I check if matching text is found in a string? I don't know, let's check overflow, let's find out. String.find, that sounds amazing. Now, is the first answer always correct on Stack Overflow? No, but the good news about plugin development is we will find out really fast if it doesn't work. Okay, so what are we looking for? If string.find uh, the text without markup decoy deployment message fragment. Do we care about the optional start position? We do not. And then that's going to, oh, it returns that. Interesting. 
Onyx Dragon says, how do I do Redux in Lua with capture groups? You can ab absolutely do that, actually. Um, and in fact, let's go ahead and say find results equals that. And then turbine dot shell dot right line dump of find results. Just so we can refresh what we're seeing there. Nope, that's not going to work. Did I leave something? I sure did. My expository code doesn't compile for some reason. OK. So what happened? We got our applied a benefit with the decoy. We got the number 17. We put out a trap. We got nil. Awesome. What we're getting, and we would probably see this if we were looking at the Lua manual, Lua string dot find, is that we're either going to get, uh, we're either going to get nil, uh, or we're going to get the index where it occurs at. Awesome. It's always nice to uh, to check these things and make sure. Thurlow says, strictly speaking, they're not regular expressions, but Lua patterns, which are not quite as powerful. That's a fair point. Uh, and when someone says regular expressions, it's reasonable to then ask, well, what do you mean by that? Because there are multiple versions of regular expressions out there. Um, yep. Hey. Uh, Thorlar tried to put in a reference for Lua 5.1. Let's go ahead and just put that out there. Um, yeah, absolutely. The reference manual. And remember that the Lua 5.1 that is baked into Lotro is a, um, a constrained set of operations. So you can't necessarily do everything that you could in normal standard Lua 5.1 uh, because Lotro does lock down things that you can do, I believe. Or if it doesn't, they could. Um, OK, so uh, we can see we're getting either an index or nil. Great. So um, we don't need to spit out that anymore. But we can say if find results is not nil, then uh, we found the text. Doesn't, we don't actually care what the result was. We just care that it wasn't nil, that it was somewhere in there. Uh, so we can go ahead, and that was it. Uh, so is that enough? Well, let's go ahead and put out a trap. Nothing. Let's put out a deadly decoy. Awesome. You deployed a decoy, you awesome hunter, you. Uh, Thurlow does point out that the another way you could write this is if find a result. I'm oh, sorry. If will that invert it? Hmm. What about just if find results? Can we do we need to compare it against nil? OK, so in this case, since we're saying it's not equal to nil, we can just do a Boolean comparison against find results. Hmm. Onyx Dragon uh, asks, what is string uh, dot find return? This is either going to be nil if nothing, uh, not found a number, um, sorry, the starting index if found. So in this case, we're getting 17 as the result because Benefit with dead the decoy is starting at 17 characters in um, or more if there's a critical success. So um, this comes down to a style test. If you want to explicitly say you're comparing it against nil, if you just want to uh, coerce it as a Boolean, um, either one will work. Uh, as long as you're consistent throughout your code, I don't think I feel like one is better than the other. Um, in my day job, I tend to use languages like C Sharp. Uh, and there, there's a strict separation between the concept of a Boolean, which is either true or false, um, and an object, which either is set to a value or is null. And you can't, um, or you shouldn't be comparing a Boolean to null or an object to true or false. 
And I think that bleeds through to how I write Lua, even though that's not necessary. Uh, and so I'm calling out explicitly that I'm checking gets nil because I believe that it can either be nil or not nil, uh, as opposed to a Boolean, which I, you know, intrinsically I believe should either be true or false, uh, but true, false, and nil is a bit of a weird Boolean for me. So anyway, uh, personal taste, so, but functionally uh, it seems to be pretty identical. Awesome. So we are able to detect when the decoy starts. And we know by default, 15 seconds later is when it stops. So the real question um, is, do we know if the decoy is destroyed before that? Because that would be really nice. Well, we need something that can destroy a decoy. And what better thing to find in the middle of Bree than Woe of the Willow? So I'm gonna start up a, an instance. Now this character is not a character I have played very much. So I'm gonna start uh, up an instance at say level 40. And I am probably going to die, but the important thing is, does my decoy die first? In the heart of the old forest, hmm. Thurlor says, from the that's a good point. Um, Thurlor thinks by convention, if you have something that is uh, Boolean, um, uh, there are ways to to have a naming convention within your code to kind of uh, call out whether something is meant to be a boolean or not. Um, so in this case, it might be a little bit more destructive to say. Um, I mean, if you want to be really destructive, you would say uh, found index or nil, right? Uh, and you could just call it out like that. Like this is either a nil or index or a nil. And then this comment is kind of redundant at that point, right? Like it's going to be the found index for nil. Now, kind of like w once you are comfortable with language and you're working with other people that are also comfortable, this is this kind of describing what the language should be doing gets a, a rather redundant, right? And at, at that point, you'll find better names. But um, you know, this is a way to do it. Uh, if you wanted to treat it like a boolean, you could uh, instead call it, you know, it is found. Um, that's a, a kind of a common way to call out that this should be a yes or no answer. Um, actually, since it's not a yes or no answer, it's either nil or an, a number, uh, I think I'll just leave it for here right now. Cool, okay. So, uh, you know what? I deleted some code that now I kind of regret because I would like to know um, local chat type equals that. So I would kind of like to make use of this logic here. So then chat type equals enemy. Um, if, oh, I need an end there. If our chat type, so I think Onyx, you were saying that you should learn uh, Lua at some point. Um, hopefully you get a sense as you are looking uh, at what we're doing here that the syntax of Lua, if you're familiar with any other programming, I have a feeling my desktop audio is a little loud. I'm gonna turn that down. If you're familiar with any uh, programming language, then this is probably gonna feel pretty readable. Well, you might not know what exactly you should be writing, um, but it should feel pretty readable. And importantly, there's a lot of stuff uh, that is optional. Like these parentheses that I'm using here, uh, they are not needed. And the semicolon that I'm using there, that's not needed either. It's, you know, it's more for, for me than for the uh, system. So it would be just fine to say if args.chat type equals, um, we'll go ahead and just copy that up, um, then uh, chat type equals def, uh, and that's fine too. Like you don't you don't need the, the rest of it. <laughs> mm, right. So depending on which standard of C you may not have uh, nil as a language construct, it may just be defined uh, with a macro. Uh, but that you know you can conceptually think of, of nil as being pretty similar. Uh, in Lua you either have a, an object that has an, a reference, a table reference, or it does not, and you can call it zero, you can call it nil. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a, a really hacky way of figuring out what that chat uh, type is. Uh, if I was gonna be doing this more, um, then I would probably extract that out to a function somewhere so that we can label this. 
Uh, but, but for right now, it's fine. Uh, and then, okay, we want to go ahead and turbine.chill.writeline. Uh, we do want that text without markup. Uh, but first, we want to go ahead and say the chat type text without markup, just so uh, we can confirm what we're seeing uh, in the plugin. And if we're not seeing something, that's, that's good to know too. Cool, so just to double check. Awesome, we can see in the combat player, uh, Arto applied a benefit. And that's exactly what we see up there as well. Cool. Um, you know what? I didn't actually see. Was there a death channel? There is not a death channel. I wonder what that corresponds to. Okay, so we can see a couple of little level 40 trolls up here. They are almost certainly going to kill this poor character. No. <laughs> okay, there's lots of stuff coming in. Uh oh. Look away, Arda. Oh, that's sad. I have a level 30 bow, I think. Arthaliel was very nice. Oh, level 38. That's very nice. No, it's fine. Um, so, what do we have? We can see on combat player that we went ahead and put out the, um, the deadly decoy. Awesome. And then it's, we can see it hitting the wood troll. Great. Uh, well, critically hit the wood troll. Oh, withdraw attention. Well, that's cool. Okay. Um, so it's using its draw attention skills. Sometimes it critically succeeds. All is good with the world. And in the enemy combat, we can see all the damage the enemy is doing to the, uh, the deadly decoy. Oh, hey. <coughs> all right. Um, yeah, well, if you can figure out how to incre increment my death count, this will be the first time we've died on stream because we haven't really left free since now. Although, have we left free? Now, this is actually um, interesting. If you go to the Lotro wiki for Deadly Decoy, uh, there's, uh, well, first of all, it hasn't been updated in a long time, so we might be able to do some of that. Oh, hey. <laughs> some people are suggesting things. Um, how about died? Well, I tried. I like yours, Thorlor. Although, wouldn't it be plus plus death count? Oh. <laughs> Hooray! Awesome. Thanks, little redhead. <laughs> okay. Um, so, one of the things I, I noticed in here is the wiki says it has no more morale, so it cannot die. Uh, but we clearly saw that the wood troll defeated the Master Trapper's decoy. One of the things that I thought would be neat is to kind of hone in how much morale does a deadly decoy have? Um, so, that, that is interesting. You have to remember what the old number was? Okay, uh, sorry. So, um, my theory, my starting out theory is, well, maybe a deadly decoy has about as much health as you do. So if I summon out a deadly decoy, I have 4,367 morale. Maybe the decoy also has that, and that's why uh, that, that's how it gets a little balanced. Because you'll notice if you go into a very low level area, your decoy never dies. Uh, and if you go into really a high level area, like uh, it'll die with a couple of swipes. So it seems to have a similar um, survivability as your character. So that's my first thought is maybe it has about as many points as I do. And wouldn't it be neat if we could use this? as well as telling us when the deadly decoy will blow up to kind of confirm that idea. What does it mean for a decoy to critically six, uh, to come out? Does that mean it has twice as much health? Half again as much health? Three times? Uh, so those are some thoughts I have in the back of my head. Um, in fact, deadly decoy. Um, we can see two things. When killed, um, we get a, what was that uh, message? Um, let's see, did we, did we see it? 
Um, the Wood Troll Warrior defeated the Master Tapper's Deadly Decoder. Okay, so that came in on the Death Channel. When killed, the Death Channel reports death. Um, let's see if we can get that. Cool. Um, side project. Count how much damage the decoy receives. Use it to estimate death somehow. So I think that would be really neat because, um, oh, Thrill Alert wonders if it's a critical hit that uh, has to, to kill it. Exactly, these are the things I'm interested in because if it's just a flat out when it has received as much health as the character that summoned it had, then that's super easy to show you how much health it has left, right? Like this could be really cool. Um, oh no, it's about to die. Don't count on it. Run, run, run. Or, oh, it's, it's fine. It's it, that pig attacking. It's level nine. It's never going to die. I, so, um, th this is why I have trouble shipping, uh, plugins because I think of things to do. Uh, absolutely. So Onyx says, I guess you could add up the morale used over time and store that, um, start averaging it to get an estimate. Ab absolutely. Um, even just 10 or 20 times, uh, if you if the plugin just reports, oh, it it took 103% of it of your health to kill it. It took 104%. If that number is never below 100%, that's cool. And if we track that something was critically succeeded, um, a, a critical um, what, do we, what do we call it? Yeah, uh, a critical benefit. Um, if that's always like 152%, 154%. If that's never below 150%, then that. Um, Help us see. Thurlor says, are you seeing the amount of damage? Well, I can't speak to whether I'm seeing um, correct amounts of damage, but let's see. Let's scroll on down here. Um, all right. The Wood Troll Warrior scrolled a hit with a weak swipe attack on Arda, but um, did we see stuff? That's an excellent question. Um, so far, we are not, but we are seeing, let's see, let's, let me come in here. So combat enemy. Yes, Wood Troll Warriors scored a hit on the Master Trappers at the decoy. So we can, uh oh, not well. <laughs> mm. So there's an excellent question that I will answer right after I retreat which was, if you are targeting on, thank you, little redhead. Oh, this is, we're, we're gonna get dozens and we're never gonna make it past the first group. It's gonna be great. Um, so, uh, if we call out a deadly decoy, first of all, there is no standard box. You just get Master Tapper's decoy. Now, you can dismiss it early if you want to, uh, but if you don't do that, what, what do we get? What do we get? Okay, we can see they're damaging it. They're damaging it. I waited long enough. Notice that the decoy is strong enough to blow up and kill them. Delightful. The roller asks, can you select it? You might be able to access its morale through the API. Oh, that's interesting. Although I wouldn't want the hunter to have to select it, but that might be a good way to try things out. Um, so, oh, I'm gonna go in so many different directions. When clicking the decoy, and we query the target info. Okay, so uh, let's let's look at that idea from Thurlore. Uh, so not remembering how to talk about targets, let's come on in and see what we see as far as um, turbine.gameplay. Let's see, so selection maybe? Well, that's not it. Let's see. <laughs> Thurlo says, much of plugin authoring is figuring out through trial and error which features of the API work. Uh, sure, absolutely. And and also to a certain extent, uh, what the API, what, um, what things are possibly available in the first place. Um, all right, so the UI is all about drawing our own window stuff on the screen. I would assume it's not in there. And then the UI.lotro uh, is again, more Lotro branded things on the screen. So assuming it's not in there right now, that narrows our search space. 
All right, we have gameplay attributes. We'll come back to that. And we have turbine.gameplay. All right. Um, let's see. Let's browse through here for a bit. Entity, that could be interesting. Actor item mount, actor could be interesting. Player, no. Player or party member. All right, there's some possible stuff there. Property handler. Hmm. Um, entity reference. No, that's interesting. Huh? Get pet, get master out. Oh, that's an interesting idea. All right, a pet is an actor that a player owns and controls. Um, I like it. So um, we can assume when the decoy deployed function is called that we have a pet. So local pet equals, and all right, how do we get that? Well, the local player might have something about that. Oh, well, actually, sorry, the pet class itself. Hmm, we might need to, to get it from the local player. Get pet, yes. All right, and then of course, how do we get the local player? Now, I'm going to cheat. I happen to remember that getting the local player is something that I have made use of in the D tracker. Uh, let's see, globals, local player. Sweet, so turbine.gameplayer, local player, get instance. Ah, there we go, it's right there. Um, so get instance, we can go ahead and get the local player that way. Um, so, local, local player equals, and then pet equals local player. And we saw that there's a get pet function here. Get pet. And then we saw that under pet, there is a get max morale. I love it. Local max morale equals pet get max morale. What's the difference between max morale and base morale? Well, we'll come back to that. We'll see if this even works. Turbine dot shell dot right line pet max morale. Awesome. Now, another thing we can do while we're in here is um, if this pet is, oh, for a lot of things, it's based without, is without buffs. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another thing we can do is say if this pet is valid at all, we could maybe dump it out and see if there's anything more useful to do in there. All right. Let's do that. So we'll do a quick dump of pet while we're at it, just in case that uh, gives us anything interesting. Now, will this work? No idea. Uh, but that's a great thing about plugin development, is double-edged sword, is when you wanna try something, you just try something. Okay. Um, so, let's go ahead and, okay. Attempt to index gameplay is a null field, because you know what I didn't import was that. Awesome, turbine.gameplay. Let's tell it what that means. Thanks, Doug the Decoy. All right, so trying again. Okay, attempt to index local pet a null value. Okay, so it looks like that doesn't count as a pet, not, not in that sense. Um, or not in a traditional sense, because of course, um, we're thinking lore masters or, actually now you mention it, what about rune keepers? Do their runes have health? Uh, sorry, um, just circling back to that idea that this might not just be a hunter's thing. So um, yeah, uh, when you're a lore master and you have a bear and you send the bear off, that bear definitely has a morale bar and you can click on it and see it. So this might be treated differently internally, it's certainly uh, doesn't want to come back with the get pet command. That's too bad. That would have been a really awesome uh, sort of sidestep into here. Is there anything else that we can get? Get. 
Oh, you know what? There is a hunter thing here. Let's see if hunter attributes has anything interesting. We have focus and stance, focus change, get stance. No, oh well. Oh, there are a lot of things that might be delayed before get pet will work. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, there are ways to deal with that. So, uh, one of the things that will probably come up too is how do you deal with timers? How do you actually say, oh, 15 seconds is elapsed or one second, two seconds, three seconds, that kind of thing. <laughs> so Thurler recommends using the target change callback. And I think that's a really interesting idea. So um, because we can't target it until it's out. So one of the things we can do is we can come into local player and Instead of looking at the methods, let's look at the events. Because I'm assuming that's where we might find target changed. Fired when the actor's target changed. Great, let's uh, take a look at that instead. So let's go ahead and pretend like we didn't write any of that. And instead, come on in and, well, let's go ahead and get that local player. Now, this is a mess. We're just doing a bunch of things here. We'll do some reorganization later once we have a sense of the direction that we're going. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and request to be told when the target changes. Local player target changed equals a function. Now, what is the signature of that function? Well, it's usually uh, the same, but let's click on here. We can see it's sender args. Great, sender args. So um, a basic, is it working? So I've got red line, target changed. And local player probably gives us uh, the get target function. That sounds great. Uh, local target equals local player get target. Uh, and why not? Let's go ahead and do a dump of that. Uh, while we're at it. Center is just local player. Oh, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I get really lazy about using the sender argument. I, I feel like I should be better at just saying, obviously the sender is gonna be local player. We don't need to, to have that, but this is, this is all co-located, right? Like I have the sender player. Um, yeah, absolutely. Target could be nil. Um, that is a great point. But in this case, the dump function should be fine with nil. Yeah, we'll just get a two string of nil, I think. We'll find out, actually. Let's, uh, let's see how that behaves when we don't have anything targeted. Okay, so if I target myself, awesome, target changed. Um, cool. And if I click off, yeah, we can see the dump function just dump, uh, converts that to nil, which is really handy to sanitize possibly nil values. Okay, awesome. So we're getting uh, we're definitely getting told when our target is changing. And then back to the API, what can we do with that? Well, that's an actor. Um, actor has some methods like get max morale. Neat. So if target is not equal to nil, then uh, we can go ahead and uh, try to do that. So target get max morale. And we'll even uh, tell us what we're doing. Uh, targets max morale is that. Okay. So, oh, that's fascinating. My max morale is 4,367.2578125. I'm guessing uh, there's some sort of a lack of a rounding there. Oh, interesting, uh, get max morale could be nil, you think? Well, before we encounter that, let's just sanitize it. Cool. That is wild. Is that really a floating point number or is this an API issue? Oh, good point. Not not everything has a target uh, has a morale. Okay, so let's just go ahead and pop that out. Oh, that's beautiful. 
Well, that is confusing. Why is it 2,670? So now I'm pulling out my calculator to figure out how, how is that different from uh, what I currently have. So <laughs> uh, certainly it's not because of my vitality. I wonder if it's always that. Uh, okay, so now I need to play around with that for a little while. So yeah, Thurler wonders if I remove all my gear. Maybe that's my base morale. Um, actually, while we're thinking about it, Let's add a few more things in here. Uh, so we already know there was a get max morale, but let's uh, let's see if there's a difference for a get base morale because base max morale uh, that that might be instructive. I'm guessing for the decoy it's going to be the same because why would you not? Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get to see this, and then we can also do players. Uh, base max morale and players uh, max morale by probably local player might have something similar. Yeah, ba base max morale, max morale, awesome. So if we just substitute in local player here for those two, uh, and then we can get that information too. All right, so summon out the decoy, click on the decoy. So we can see the players <laughs> base and max are identical. Uh, targets base and max are identical. That's hilarious and unexpected. So, next up, go ahead and remove gear and see how that affects these things. Uh, looks like I don't have much in the way of jewelry. That is part of my survivability problem. And that, oh yeah, look at that sword, level seven. Oh, and we'll just remove those two just so I don't have anything for Hobbit. Okay, um, so. Oh, fascinating, you do need a weapon equipped for the decoy, all right. So we're gonna have a bow. Okay, um, base max morale and max morale, still the same, but that did not change the deadly decoys morale. And now I have to be wondering, is it related to the level of the player? Is it just a flat constant or uh, a scaled, maybe some sort of a function? Um, so two, six, seven, zero divided by 50, like, 53.4 per level doesn't make a lot of sense. And especially as you get higher level, there's a bit of an exponential curve uh, between one level and the next. So the, the difference between 100 and 110 is way smaller than the difference between 120 and 130 uh, is, is what it feels like. So now if I had a hunter and just went uh, to each level after you get the depth of decoy, 10-ish. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, and then just checked the health after each level. That would be really interesting. Um, as it is, it's not related to player's health, unless it's meant to be 61% of the player's health. It may be harder to predict without a lookup table for level and deadly decoy strength. So maybe we'll um, come back to that. But that is really cool that we know that it's morale is easily detectable, although not through the, the pet. Are there any traits that affect decoy morale? That is exactly, Thur um, Thurlor, what I was just pulling this up to find out. Um, and then Onyx, is there an event you can key off of if your decoy gets hit? Well, if it were a pet, then we would get a pet type and pets have events like morale changed. Um, but 
we aren't seeing this as a pet. And so, absolutely, Onyx. Um, there are combat chat messages. We are seeing combat enemy. Um, so when the wood troll is attacking the master trapper, we get who attacked it, for how much. Um, and so it would be quite possible to um, just sum up how much this current decoy has received, and after 15 seconds, stop, or if the decoy dies, stop, either way. And so we know how much damage the decoy has received within the constraints of um, combat message throttling, if, if for some reason we're just not getting it because stuff is coming in so fast. Uh, but within that constraint, we know how much damage the decoy has received. Oh, hey, Chromite. Um, welcome to chat. So today, uh, we're looking at how many times I can die at the entrance to Woe with Willow. Uh, no, what I'm interested in is a um, plugin that will give a, a lifetime left uh, re remaining of the decoy before it blows up, the deadly decoy in this case. So it's 15 seconds, or if it's killed, then it won't explode. But after 15 seconds, bam, it blows up. And so what I would like is an on-screen visual representation of that timer. <laughs> Thurlor has a derogatory name for it. Hmm. Um, Thurlow's, that is an excellent point. Let's go ahead in this target changed and get that local pet or get that pet. And we're just going to write out the status of it. That way we don't have to worry about, um, oh. Where did my plugin manager go? I must have hit escape. Okay. So go ahead and bring that out. Click on that. Pet is still nil. So I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that any pet like thing that doesn't have a standard bar, but just has a name like this, um, is not going to be retrievable using the pet. Anything else in get a local player that we could use? Probably not. Maybe it's a mount. I don't think it's a mount. We, uh, it's not a racial thing, and we know that the class is uh, doesn't have anything about the decoy either, or at least nothing documented. It might be interesting to delve in and see if there's stuff under the covers that aren't in the uh, documentation. Chromite says, yeah, is there a way to monitor its morale? That's uh, kind of where we were is if it were a pet, then we could uh, ask to be notified when it was damaged. As it is, we do see combat uh, logs in the combat enemy channel uh, when an enemy attacks the decoy and does damage. Oh, no, even when it doesn't. Good job, decoy. Way to parry. Awesome. Uh, so it would definitely be possible to add up how much damage has been taken. One of the things we were curious about is how much health it had, and we can tell how much if we uh, just monitor what we click on, but we don't want the hunter to have to click on the decoy to know how much health it is. We could do that. Um, like that, that is certainly a thing you could do is say, hey, if you want ac accurate health tracking, just click the decoy before you continue on with, with combat. Um, but I think that's a, uh, um, would be, <laughs> Uh, I think that would be a nice, like, a little bonus. Um, what type is other objects? Room funnel? I'm not sure what your question is, but yes, if you can click on it and, or, or right click on it, then it would probably be t a target, even though it d wouldn't have morale or something like that. And I think, uh, that is what I'm seeing. So if I click on that creeping root, well, of course that's an enemy. I love how there's a fractional amount of morale. Sorry, I should stop playing with that. Okay, um, so we have get target. That's definitely working. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're not going to get active um, event handling based notification of it being hit. We'll just have to do it with combat chat monitoring. Um, it, 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, is the fractional morale, uh, so we have uh, a rounded morale of 4690 and a fractional 4689.96. So there's a rounding function going on. Uh, same thing, actually, as we saw with player's health. So mine is 1639.25 or 2.26, and it's getting rounded down to 1639. Yeah, so on extragon, uh, that's that is essentially what we're doing is to get max morale. So if we say, um, let's see, target changed, when target uh, is changing, oh, uh, we are effectively getting an entity. Uh, the entity could be an actor, item, or amount. Uh, if it's an actor, then um, it can be a pet or a player, uh, or just an actor. Um, and in the documentation here, under actor, you can see the get um, base morale, get uh, max morale. Uh, and so those are the functions we're calling uh, as we're clicking around. And that's uh, why um, Thurlor was recommending that if you're going to be uh, calling get this thing, you should check to see if that is going to be null. Yeah, there's a lot of inheritance on Extragon uh, going on here. So uh, we can see that actor, oh, is it documented here? Yeah, if you click on the, the, the class itself, you can see the hierarchy going on here and how any actor is gonna be an entity um, which is, is just gonna step its way up the tree. Uh, and if you're looking at the methods here, the ones on the left are the ones that are actually um, specified by this class, but the complete list shows uh, derived ones as well. And if it, I'm sorry, inherited. And if it is inherited, where it's from. So the get alignment we can see comes from the player, uh, which local player uh, inherits from. Hmm. Thurlor says you could use the active skill cooldown reset event or something. I think what you're saying is um, to know when the dead the decoy has blown up, or um, because one of, one of the things is the dead the decoy, at least my version, has a cooldown of 18 seconds, but it will blow up after 15 seconds unless it's been destroyed in less than 15 seconds. So uh, because of the mismatch there, oh, to know when they've clicked it. Hmm. Uh, certainly. Let's not be able to drag that around. Um, yeah, that is a fair point. If, if we didn't want to go to the chat log uh, or if it was uh, not working in some way, we might be able to do that as well because that is something that uh, you can do in Lua is to know when people have or when the, the player has used their skills. That may be the only way to know the cooldown if they have some kind of cooldown or reducing buff. That's a fair point. Um, as far as I know, there's no buff to reduce, so there's no trait or buff to reduce the amount of time it takes for the decoy to explode. Now, that might just be a limitation of the wiki, uh, which has not been <laughs> updated for a few years. Um, let's see. Increase the damage from the explosion, incoming critical chance debuff. Um, so, if there's a way to decrease the amount of time it takes for it to blow up, I, I'm not aware of it. So that 15 seconds, I'm pretty comfortable just like hard coding that. Um, that's, uh, for, for a display of how much time is left, I have no problem with that. It's really just, um, yeah, when was it deployed? Okay, cool, start the timer, 15 seconds, and then, uh, Maybe a distinction between the skill cooldown timer and the decoy explosion delay. Hmm. Yeah. Oh well, that's the fun thing about doing a plugin like this, or, or playing around with the idea of a plugin, is we we can just uh, dig around and uh, see what happens. Um, cool. Okay. So we have seen. What have we seen? We've seen that when you place the deadly decoy, we get a combat message, and in fact, we've seen that for traps as well. Um, all right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just do this because I'm curious. Wait, where on earth is my tripwire?
Well, I wasn't trying to get hit. <sighs> okay, uh, that's okay. What I was curious is if we could tell whether the trap had expired. Let's see. All right, so when I toss out a tripwire, we know the tripwire is there. Um, one of the things I had in mind was not just the deadly decoy, but also other traps. Like, hey, you've got a tripwire out and it hasn't expired yet. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for updating that little redhead. Uh, you've got a uh, piercing trap. I don't know my traps very well, I'm afraid. Um, so one of the things I thought was, wouldn't that be neat to have a sense of uh, what traps are still, a bit, um, still out and about? Too far away. Well, why are you showing it to me then? There we go. Nope. Well, it's tripped. That's delightful. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing a chat message showing that a trap has been triggered or has run out of time. So I think that dashes my hope of it being able to track traps as well. So we'll focus on the decoy. Excellent. Um, cool, cool, cool. So um, we see a message when the decoy goes out. We see a message in the death channel, which in game is the combat event channel. It's a little uh, more user friendly, I think. Um, and then we also see in uh, the combat enemy channel, uh, we see how much damage is coming into the decoy. So I think we have all the bits and pieces we need, except possibly how much health does the decoy have? Uh, so I've already forgotten, so we'll just summon it back out. And it's 2670. So uh, we know a level 50 decoy, or I should say we know my level 50 decoy has 2670. And so if it's a flat value per level, that's informative. Certainly, um, we've seen that there are traits to increase the explosion power, but we haven't seen traits to increase the health uh, or change the, uh, how long it takes to explode. <laughs> Daryl Laura says, might need to log into Bulwer and make a table of the decoy morale by level. Yeah, or just make another character. And <laughs> yeah, um, so you might know on Bulwer, can, is there an NPC to talk to to change your level or to level up? And so you can just start up uh, one and keep going. Okay, so we have a lot of the bits and pieces and that's pretty cool. So really it's just a question of what do we need? And so a thing that I know we need is the ability to have a timer. And uh, I have ideas for that because we've already seen the Minstrel Buffs uh, plugin that uses a timer to shrink stuff on screen. And we've, we see that in numerous plugins. <laughs> From Bono says, just get Chromite to check the decoy at morale on his 216 hunters. Yeah, that's fair. All right, this seems like a dangerous place. Maybe I should go back to Bree. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about timers. So because plugins are so UI oriented, uh, it's very common for timers to be implemented as a hidden control saying, or sometimes not hidden, saying, I want an update from the game. And then when, it, when the update function is called, it will then check how long has it been since the thing, is it time to do the thing? Um, Kermit says, I only use, or Thurlor says, I'm surprised Kermit doesn't know the decoy morale for each level by heart. Kermit says, I only use it for pre-fight buffs uh, because of the crit debuff it gives. Uh, yeah, I uh, I have heard that some people really enjoy playing Yellow Line Hunters, and some other people think that there uh, there are better ways to engage in in uh, instances. And so, uh, I don't know. Yellow Line seems fun, though. Okay, uh, I'm just going to close that encounter table for a bit. We have plenty to work from from the uh, Boar Fountain statue area. 
So a thing, um, when was the last time I had a timer? Sorry, I'm just trying to remember uh, where I would have used that. Certainly not the opaque quest tracker. The D tracker has a timer in there. Mm, for deadly plus stuff, Yellow Hunter is preferred because traps bypassing damage reduction. That That is exactly what triggered me wanting a timer for when Deadly Decoy came out, is because we were noticing how effective it was to simply gather up a bunch of really lethal things, uh, and then boom, and eight things fall over dead. And it was delightful. And I was like, wouldn't this be better if we knew when that explosion was going to happen instead of just, eh, about now. Uh, I know it's only 15 seconds, and one can just count it out, but... Uh, I mean, what are plugins for but to make our life easier? Okay, so this is a timer class. This was probably inspired by someone else's timer class, which might have been inspired by someone else's timer class. But the basic idea is that we have a control, and the when you make the timer, you tell it, here's how long you are, and whether or not I want you to start back up when you're done, and here's the thing to call when the time has elapsed. Now, I made this this way because I really just, um, oh, what was it? Oh, for the D-Tracker. Um, I wanted to uh, automatically save progress when someone completed a deed, but if someone was gonna complete two or three deeds, I didn't want to just be like, save file, save file, save file, save file, right in a row after each other. So the way the D-Tracker works is when you complete a deed, it just kicks off a, let's call it five second timer. And each time you complete a deed, it will just restart that timer if you complete more than one deed. And so this is really useful if you're manually clicking off deeds or if you are have just completed deeds of Reland and that um, be, by completing Explorer Reland, by completing the, the ruins of the Dunedain. Um, and so, yeah, each one of those will, will kind of restart the timer. And after you've gone five-ish seconds without anything happening, it's like, okay, we're good. <laughs> Although that code should probably also respect the uh, are we in combat or not, <laughs> uh, which other parts of it do where we're, we're in combat. Let's not do anything complicated until we're out of combat so we don't lag out the system. Um, so saving should probably also happen outside of combat, but one thing at a time. Okay, so um, this is a, a self-sufficient timer, but if we're talking about something that is uh, meant to be on screen, then a way to do that is to kind of bake it into the object itself where it knows um, you know, when I am drawing, I am going to tick down from my maximum value to my minimum value. Uh, I think there's, there's ways to do it, uh, but in this case, um, I just needed, oh, thank you, more water. I did need more water. I wanted to refresh my memory about how I wanted to be informed of time passing, right? So when the timer is started, uh, there's a way to get the current game time from the API. And so, if your timer or our timing like device, countdown, stopwatch, whatever you're making, if you know when the thing started, then each time you are in update, you can get that same game time, do a little math and say, how long has it been? And so if you're trying to count down 15 seconds, you can, you can use um, some pretty straightforward math that way. Okay. Um, so we have an idea of how to do timers. We have some notes here. In fact, let me just save that in the Hunter Assist. Let's call it the to-do file. That way I don't accidentally visit. Okay, and we don't need the utils right now. Okay, so uh, we want two things. Uh, we, we do want that function that says the uh, decoy is uh, defeated. And for that, let's see, do we still have that? Let's see. So 
So I'm gonna go ahead and use the chat logging feature, capture that chat. Uh, so I can do a simple text search to find what I'm looking for in case it uh, is still there. It may have scrolled off. So we'll get the combat enemy log. Um, and we'll look for a decoy. Oh, it would actually be in the combat event, of course. Cool. So uh, it looks like there's a thing that is defeating the Master Trapper's deadly decoy. Um, so we can match just the stuff we care about. If we wanted to know what defeated it for um, fancy, oh no, the, the whatever took it out, uh, we can use the pattern matching that we discussed earlier to capture off the thing. But for right now, we're gonna do the simple thing and just say, there was a defeat that happened. Okay, uh, so. Decoy defeat message fragment equals that. And again, this is just in English. We'll need to uh, localize this later uh, to support other languages. Okay. And then, um, we'll want to go ahead and have another check, so found index. I get a little nervous about reusing variables like this, but. Okay. So we can go ahead and recognize that the decoy is defeated or deployed. Um, so by default, it's a 15 second timer for whatever we're doing. Uh, and then if we're defeated, we just cancel that. Maybe put some un, you know, frowny face animation on the screen, whatever. Uh, neat. So that's what we need there. Um, we can just do without this stuff right now. Um, and we are still looking at enemy combat in case we want to uh, be adding up how much damage our decoy took. Okay. Oh, that was, uh, that was left over from our experiment on the pet. We can go ahead and comment that out. Excellent. Okay, so for an on-screen timer, I'm mostly being inspired, like I mentioned at the beginning, by the Minstrel Buff plugin from the look and feel of it. Um, so the look and feel of here's the icon, here's the thing that we're counting down, and here's the bar that is counting down. So uh, if we wanted to, we could always look at how Minstrel Buff does that and uh, sort of uh, take that as inspiration. But the reality is right now, we can just go ahead and put something that looks similar to that. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and make a new file to keep track of this. We'll call it the um, hunter assist window.lua. We can always uh, change that name later. And we want to remember to go ahead and import that so we can use it in this main file. Under assist window. Great. And what do we want? We want something that is a window. And there are, remember that there are two different ways you can make windows using the, uh, the API. It can either be a turbine.ui.window or turbine.ui.lotro Dot window. The difference is, of course, a turbine.ui.window is just a place that you can draw stuff. It's a top-level control uh, on which you can put other things. By, by itself, it's empty, it's invisible, it doesn't have any behaviors. And a Lotro window looks like a standard window in-game. It's got this little blue button at the top, 
It's got the silver uh, filigree on the corners, and it's got the little X button to close it. All those fancy things. It's draggable, uh, it's resizable, fun, fun stuff. But uh, if all we're trying to do is show a little icon on the screen, it's overkill. So we're going to need to go ahead and have a turbine.ui.window. Okay, excellent. All right, so we saw in the timer that we just had in this file, the thing, and that seems fine for uh, our purposes. Hunter assist window at is not work, right? Equals class, and then we're just gonna go ahead and do a window. Now in this window, we're gonna want two things. We're going to want to show the icon of the dead, the decoy, and we're gonna to want to show a ticking down bar. Uh, so this window is going to contain two things. But for now, uh, we can just have it contain one thing. That'll be fine. So. Just uh, setting up some basic code here. I'm just kind of copying uh, what we saw before. Now, since this is a window, uh, windows come with a couple things uh, like the set to visible. So we'll want to make uh, take advantage of that. Function hunter assist window show. So we can go ahead and do a self set visible. Awesome. Might need to spell it right. And we'll probably want a uh, function hunter assist window hide, same thing. Now, could we go ahead and from this just call the set visible on it? We could, maybe we should, I'll have to think about that. But for now, I'm doing this as a way of uh, kind of building up more complicated things. Thank you. correctly points out that I'm forgetting to, uh, to use the, uh, the colon notation for function calling. Okay, what else do we want? Well, we want to show the image. We already have the image, so that's really convenient. Um, how do we set a background image? Well, set background. Oops. We can set the background of a control. Oops, sorry, pardon me as I thump the microphone. Uh, so we need a control to hold the image and a control for the timer widget thingy. We'll come back to that. Uh, so uh, control for the image. Image control equals turbine dot ui dot control. Image control set um, size. We know that the thing is a 32 by 32 image. Uh, and image control set background. So what do we do with set background? Well, it's a path or an ID of the image. This is either a hexadecimal number or a string path to the resource file. Uh, it's a fantastic interface. Um, so for images loaded, it's either TGA or JPEG, awesome. Uh, pass should be a relative directory from the top level plugins folder. All right. Uh, if we want to see this in action, we can always pull up a different plugin. For instance, the D-Tracker uh, does have images, and this is what it looks like. Uh, we go ahead and just have a resource directory specified, and then it's just that plus name.tga. Third lower points out, it can be a turbine.ui.graphic that you previously created. Absolutely. Um, we can take advantage of that in more complicated situations. And here, of course, we just are going to use the image once. So I'm just going to call it straight from the file. Um, okay. So uh, this is more complicated than I need it to be. So let's go ahead and set the background. We want that to look something like this. But we'll change the name here to Hunter Assist Resources. And then we know it was deadly decoy dot. Mm. 
PGA. Great. Okay. Uh, and the next thing, of course, and well, perhaps the first thing, you need to set a parent for any control that is not a top level control, otherwise, it will not be drawn. So, image control. That's recursive. Self. There we go. So, location. Um, we don't really need to worry about that. Let's just say uh, self set size. We're going to go ahead and call it 40 by 40 just to make sure it's big enough. Uh, and anything else? That might be enough for us to play around with right now. Let's go ahead and set a location though. Um, and uh, like 600 by 400. Classic monitor resolution. Okay. Let's see what we're missing by trying it out. So decoy deployed. We want to go ahead and um, hunter assist window. We haven't made one of those yet. Let's go ahead and make one of those. Uh, for now, we'll just stick it at the file level. I'll have to remember if that's the right uh, syntax. Well, it sure was not invalid function call. Uh, that's what I was worried about. Oh, hey. Well, what have I done? Let's find out. So in Hunter Assist window, line four, I was attempting foolishly without uh, looking at things to set the size. Did I misspell something? No, set size. Do we have self? Oh, self is a, no. Self should be okay. Maybe I'm invoking it incorrectly. So let me go ahead and do a quick search. How am I using it in other places? Always handy. No, nope, that's pretty much what I was looking for. Awesome. Figuring out what I've typed wrong is sometimes the hardest part. Well, I did use a colon, Thurlor, but I was expecting that to be a reasonable thing to type. Invalid member function call. Yeah. You know, Lua's version of object oriented befuddles me, I'm afraid. And so I'm just going to go cheat, go look at another one that. All right, instance equals that. Or ask what's at line four? It's the self dot uh, self set size. Um, so you know what? Don't even worry about it. We won't even set that size. All right, awesome. Now we get a different error. Sixteen invalid member function call. That tells me that I am not uh, doing my class stuff correctly, which is no surprise. Uh, doing class stuff for me in Lua is not very natural. Uh, I just don't use it actively enough. Like I should, uh, I do it when I'm doing plugins, but that's then I then I go away and I forget about it. So, D tracker main window. How do you work? 
Okay, so we can see the same syntax there, lovely. Although, where is it instantiated? In main, probably. We're doing get instance, get instance. We instantiate it, lovely. Can you just not do function calls in a constructor? Maybe you can't. That would make sense because a constructor is a terrible place to do function calls. But later on, are right, I didn't call the parent constructor, and more importantly, I was just noticing, um, well, maybe that is the most important thing. Let's call the parent constructor. Excellent. So, um, the way Lua works, you not only de uh, declare what class something is, but you do, in your constructor, have to explicitly call it the parent constructor, uh, which is just not something I'm used to. Oh, thank you uh, for putting that in there. All right, real question, does that fix all of our problems. It does not. Whoa. Okay, neat. Yeah, and then I uh, was changing something that I shouldn't have changed. Awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and dismiss that so it doesn't blow up on us. Great. So like I said, one of the things I like doing and we'll probably do in the near future would be to have in the options a little button to say, pretend like I just put out a decoy so I don't have to always be putting out a decoy. But here we go. We have a window. We have a window that is showing us the deadly decoy image. This is not a clickable button, it is just the image. It is in a fixed location. So something we would wanna do is be able to make it movable. Awesome. Uh, and we don't have the timer yet. So what would that look like? Let's take a look. Now that we are hopefully <laughs> sorted out a little bit, uh, we have, uh, we need a control that is some number of pixels wide and that will show how long is left. And when it expires, we need to hide this window. When the window is shown, we need to uh, start it back at scratch. I think it would be reasonable to create a class to handle this. Um, but we might start here and then lift stuff out later. We, we could do it either way. Um, so we have a local um, timer control. And we're going to, again, make a turbine.ui.control. And then we want to go ahead and, same thing, uh, set a parent. Thurlor asks, what kind of progress indicator are you going to make? My initial thought, and unfortunately it's not animated. Oh, I guess it could be. No, I'll try not to play a video while on, on the stream. So uh, this is the Minstrel Buffs plugin, highly recommended for minstrels. And it will, for anthems, just show a white bar that's sort of ticking down to an empty bar uh, when you, uh, to, to show that the anthem is going from its default of one minute down to zero, or you can get up to even two minutes almost down to zero. Uh, and so that's, that's a thing that I was thinking. It's like, let's just start with that, right? Um, you can make it prettier. In fact, the, the way this works is it has a fixed image background, which includes all those frames and all the fancy stuff, and it just draws a white bar on top of that. So it does, it's not doing any of the fancy stuff. It's just a white bar that gets shorter. And I think it even just does the getting shorter by making the width uh, shorter. So you start with something that's 32 pixels wide and then 31, 30, 29, 28. And so um, it's a full white bar, but the width of the bar just happens to be getting shorter. So I'm going to shamelessly steal that idea from the original creator of the Minstrel Bus plugin, which was Melida. 
Hello. I love your plugin. I like it more with a patch that I made for it, uh, but the base one is still pretty cool. Okay. Uh, so we have a control. Uh, this control is going to be, as I said, shamelessly borrowed from the idea there. So we know we want it to be as wide as the image, which is 32 pixels. Awesome. And as far as how tall it is, uh, you know, whatever. Well, let's call it five pixels. Uh, so 32 and five. Now, again, the size of it's going to change dynamically to show how far it's progressed, but that's a good starting point. In fact, um, when we show ourselves, that might be a great way to reset is timer control. Oh, you know, I declared that as local and that's just not going to do. Uh, timer control set with uh, 32. Neat. And then we just need to set its location, right? Uh, so the timer control set um, position and we want that to be below the other one. I like how um, in the original there was a few pixels gap there. So we'll just call it uh, 36, uh, uh, zero. Wait, nope, I've, I've reversed it. Let's just um, change the thing that we're actually trying to change. Set top, awesome. And then well, what do we need? We need a background color. Uh, how do we do that? Well, controls have a Set back color, pretty sure. I'm gonna check the spelling. Set back color, lovely. Let's do that. Timer, control, set back color. Now, this is a, something that takes uh, a couple different possibilities, but you can always just fall back on turbine.ui.color.white as an example. Or you can declare your own with uh, hex values and stuff. Oh, good point. Um, Thurlor, uh, I appreciate you calling me out on that. Uh, that should be self.timerControl. Uh, that way it's owned by the window. That's the whole point of doing this object oriented like. Awesome. So we have a bar. It's not changing yet, but that's okay. Uh, and then let's give it a try. Nope, something's wrong. What did I do? That was level uh, up. That, yes, I must do it for each one of them. Each time I reference timer control. Cool. So, lovely. Um, that is the spitting image of what I'm talking about. Um, the decoy plus a bar underneath. Now we just need to make that bar get smaller. All right. How do we do that? Well. Um, as we mentioned before, you can ask Lotro to basically poke you every so often, maybe 15, 20 times a second saying, hey, you want to do something? Hey, you want to do something? Hey, you want to do something? Which is perfect if you want to do something, like redraw yourself to get slowly smaller. So um, you do that two ways. First, you have to opt into it because this is kind of a resource intensive thing. You don't want uh, to get that function call for every single thing. So you want to go ahead and say you want updates. How do we do that? Set want updates. Excellent. Let's do that. Self.timerControl set want updates. True. We do want that. And more importantly, what do we do when that happens? We want to go ahead and set that update function. Self.timerControl dot update equals a function. Let's see, sender args, great. And what are we doing there? Well, um, the first thing we need um, is to know what the starting time was. And that's something we can draw inspiration from from this other timer class. There's a turbine.engine.getGameTime. time. Love it. Let's steal that. So when we show, uh, we're going to go ahead and self.timerControl.startTime. 
and this is a thing I actually kind of like about Lua and it kind of uh, scares me, is you can just store arbitrary data in an object. It, there was no predefined start time field there, but you can just shove it in there, it's fine. It, it just gets added to the table. It's all, it's all tables and tables and tables. Um, but we can go ahead and put that in there and we can even self dot uh, timer control dot start time equals zero if we want to go ahead and make sure there's something there to begin with. Hmm. Thorlore is saying there's a self set stretch mode hmm. for the window. Well, fun game. Let's see what that does. So I think in the past I've seen you talking about how um, this is how to get the game to stretch an image. Ah, beautiful, lovely. Uh, I think that would be really powerful to add that as, as an option. Oh, at the end of the constructor. Well, too bad I put it there. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, sure. We'll set it there. Um, oh. You were saying uh, do everything else first and then do that. All right, sure. Cool. Um, yeah, I, li I like the idea of allowing someone to make it as big or as small. You have me curious now. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, don't do that. <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe there'll be a max size on the slider. <laughs> cool, but it'll be nice and visible now. Oh yeah. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> that was clearly ridiculous. Actually, um, I don't know. can I bring it to the top? Right, don't cover all the screen unless you know what, uh, how to undo it. Duly, duly noted. Okay, okay, I love, I love the scaling. I, I think it's doing some interesting things uh, while it's doing the scaling. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna try my hardest not to crash my client or need to restart. Okay, um, but I think I will scale up to 100, 100. I like that uh, because it'll make it a little bit uh, easier to see. Okay, and that's still visible on the stream. <laughs> so someone was talking about what was the combat analysis plugin or one of, one of the plugins that had a um, had an Easter egg a backdoor kind of thing that if a certain person messaged you, it would pop stuff something on the screen to capture uh, mouse input. Uh, and not that I sh should think anyone should do that, but I do like the idea of being like, hey, uh, yeah, this is now your screen. <laughs> uh, but like I want them to have the present, like, like in the options, like press this button to cover your screen with a huge icon. Okay, I mean, if they do that, that's on them, right? <laughs> but since plugins can't capture keyboard input, you can always do slash plugin space unload and get rid of it. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> cool. We have that. Uh, we um, are gonna get told when we're being updated. And now what do we want? We wanna know how long has it been? Okay, cool. Uh, so we can see that example here in this update. We can see what time it is, and then we can play around with what's going on there. So uh, we can say current time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
that no, that that's a that's a good point. Thurler raises up a point that um, by default a control will capture and consume mouse input. So if I click here to try and move the the screen or the camera, the control captures that. And you're absolutely correct. This is a look don't touch kind of a thing. So if I set self um, set mouse visible, then we uh, fix that problem be before it begins. But that was highlighted a little bit by it being so large. Uh oh, so do I need to do that in each one? Yeah, sure. I was hoping it would be hierarchical, but that would be ridiculous. Uh, Cause I'm, yeah, I don't know why I was thinking that. Uh, okay, cool. So now you can see, even if I click and start dragging while my cursor was on that icon, it doesn't interfere with the camera control that we want it to be. Hmm. Iggy, would, uh, Iggy asks, what is this plugin meant to do? Is it just a focus bar? Um, no, uh, the goal was um, a, a decoy, a deadly decoy blows up after 15 seconds. And we were noticing on Treebeard when we were um, doing some, um, some missions that it was really handy because missions are still at uh, the, the, the difficulty level that you choose. So we were doing it deadly. And we were noticing the mission got way easier if we could successfully get a large clump of mobs to be near the deadly decoy when it blew up uh, because its damage wasn't scaled back on Treebeard uh, according to the difficulty level. And so I was like, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a plugin that would count down the time? And so that's what that white bar is. That white bar is gonna get smaller and smaller over 15 seconds. And after 15 seconds, the thing disappears and your decode blows up. That's hopefully a pretty simple uh, task. Cool, okay. So what are we getting? What is this current time? Um, well, some naming in here suggests that um, we're talking about Milliseconds divided uh, by a thousand. Well, that's interesting. Let's get some output. Let's figure out what we're looking at. Um, where did I put that? Okay, uh, so we have um, a current time. We have the start time. So turline dot shell dot dot right line. Uh, Autocomplete's not working. Oh well. Um, we have current time. And in fact, let's do a string out format. So current um, start delta, and we'll just do current time uh, self dot timer control dot start time, and then the difference between them, right? Uh, current time minus self dot timer control. At start time. Well, that's an ugly uh, uh, line. Let's see if we can make that a little bit better. Okay. Uh, now, in general, you don't want to write out to the console in a um, update function like this. It's going to be terrible for uh, performance. That being said, it's fine. We're just going to unload the plugin right after we uh, see it working. Okay. That's okay. First bug, I should not have asked for um, updates, set once updates, until it was time to actually do something. So let's move that down here into the show. And in hide, we want to go ahead and set that back to false. We only want to be receiving updates while we're on screen. Hmm. Burnfather says, so could you have two bars, one for timer, one for health? Um, absolutely. Onyx. Um, what it says, I don't know the health unless they click on the need to try. Um, so right now we're uncertain what the health of a decoy is at any point. We know what the current decoy is and it doesn't seem related to what equipment I'm wearing. Um, but absolutely we can track how much damage has been applied to the decoy. And if we have an idea of how much health it has at level 50, it seems to be um, 27, 2670 at level 50. So if it's a constant amount per level, we can have a simple lookup table. Uh, if it varies based on something, 
then we're not sure what, because I took off all of my equipment except my bow, uh, and I got the same health. And so, unless it's based off of the bow itself, uh, then the only other thing I can think of is it's based off of your level. So, if you have a one-to-one -one relationship between level and health, that's an easy lookup table to make, and then we can just know what the morale is. Uh, but we'll certainly be able to use that target to see what the current morale is as part of that investigation. And I love the idea of just going onto Bullroar and level, 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 and just walk through all the levels uh, and, and write down the numbers. Now, that is subject to change by SSG, of course, if we do it that way. It's not ideal. But uh, after they kind of work through the class balancing that they're working through later this year, uh, maybe... Maybe they won't be touching this aspect of hunters at all, and if they do, maybe it'll kind of um, steady down or um, settle down. Okay, uh, neat. Good question. Thank you. Uh, haven't haven't really uh, gone back to cover what's going on recently. Okay, so if I go ahead and summon that out, we can see. Fascinating. Okay. So the time that we're getting is in seconds. We can see that we're getting about 10 to 20 ticks per second. Uh, and we get um, a number back from the turbine.engine.get game time. Turbine, let's go in and take a look at that. Engine get game time. Gets the current relative game time. In seconds, oh, the documentation, oh. See, this is the kind of thing I would love to see more of in the documentation is more examples, uh, even if it's just something simple like this. Um, that being said, is, uh, is fine. Uh, cool, so it's at the second resolution, which is great. Uh, I really wish there was a way to say, just give me an update once a second. I don't need 20 updates a second, but uh, I don't think we have that kind of granularity. So, um, what can we do? We can tell how long, approximately, that it has been uh, since we uh, were started. So we have the current time, we have the local time. Um, local delta time equals, let's just go ahead and save that off, that'll be handy. So if, no, sorry. Um, yeah, if delta time is greater than 15, and we'll, we'll fine tune this, maybe it needs to be 14, then self hide. Did I call it hide? I did call it hide. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and comment that out for a minute for performance purposes. But ideally, what that means is that after 15 seconds, when the decoy goes away, this thing should go away also. That's why people invented music. There, hey, there we go. So, um, oops. So we can see that worked perfectly. After about 15 seconds, delta time, um, we went ahead and hid, which also told the uh, control that we no longer wanted updates. Now, the only thing we're missing is how wide is this thing? Okay, well, delta time is a number of seconds and it's gonna be between zero and 15. So we can scale the width of that uh, bar by that much. Okay, oops. Um, so local bar width equals um, delta time divided by 15 times um, the starting with. Now there's a lot of magic numbers going on here and I'll wanna clean that up at some point, but we know the thing's supposed to be 32 wide. Um, and so this will give us something. So self.timer control set width bar width. Good point, it should be in the else clause thriller. That would have been very disappointing. Let's grab that. Okay. So if it's greater than 15, we hide. Otherwise, we go ahead and calculate a new width. Um, like I said, there's a lot of, uh, there's more math going on here than I would like. I, I would like some sort of only once a second to do this thing the rest of the time, just bail early. But the good thing is this is basic arithmetic, which computers are really good at. 
So it's not that much extra work. Okay, what do we see? The only problem we have is I kind of had it pictured counting down instead of counting up. That's okay, uh, we'll come back to that. Ah, so good. That's, that's really, that's fun. So what do we want? Uh, we want the bar width to be uh, 32 minus that. Uh, we just want to invert that number. Thurlow says, if you only got one update per second, you wouldn't see the bar smoothly resizing. That's absolutely true. Although, um, if it's only 32 wide, uh, and you have increments of 15, there's only so much ticking, uh, a smooth ticking it's gonna do. Uh, so, uh, that's so pretty. I'm just gonna look at it for another five seconds. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> but if I made it huge, absolutely. Instead of scaling a 32 up to 100, if it was actually 100 wide, um, absolutely true. Uh, and so that, that would be a thing to maybe uh, uh, refine here. So what are we missing? The only thing we're missing is testing it in combat. Does it go away if it gets destroyed? Well, we're in the middle of Bree, so that's the perfect place to go find some opponents. Uh, let's make sure... It's fast, but not too fast by setting them 10 levels below. Okay, so in the Witwo of the Willows. So if we go ahead and pull that out. Oh no, no, I got everything. Okay, so it turns out uh, we're going to want to know if we die. Um, okay, so that was incapacitated you. See, this is why we test. Uh, because it turns out if you go down, it, uh, your um, decoy does too. Okay, self-defeat message. Fragment equals that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thanks, little redhead. All right, and we'll just do this uh, nice little copy-paste here uh, for the self-defeat message fragment, then decoy defeated. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not strictly true the decoy is not defeated, but it's effectively true. Okay, get that plugin manager back in here. Okay, note to self, summon out the decoy. Oh, I remember, I forgot to put on all my gear. It will last slightly longer with all of that. <laughs> Apologies. All right, so we go ahead and put that out and we can see it ticking down. And this is actually where I really wanted to come into this is, okay, I think we're good. Go ahead and get them to come run over. And boom. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, we didn't actually test it dying, so that'll be the next one is... Hello, you. Oh, yep, that... Uh, interesting, I got notification of it dying before visually it went away, which makes sense, because those things just kind of fade out. Uh, Fun. What are we at, six? Maybe five. Awesome, okay, so what do we have? We have a, um, a basic window that responds to your decoy going out, your decoy, well, the timer expiring as if it is responding to it exploding, but really it's just a 15 second internal timer uh, with a counting down bar and it will respond to uh, your decoy uh, dying by, by just clearing early. Although it'd be nice if there was some sort of like poof thing to like kind of emphasize that's what happened. But uh, for, if you haven't seen it, um, let's see. 
there's some fun animation things you can get into. I'm going to pull up the plugin compendium to go ahead and add in a plugin. Uh, one of my really commonly used plugins by Thurlor, thank you very much, is Reminders. Okay, install complete. And refresh, Reminders. Uh, yeah, thank you. Treebeard. And so one of the things that you can see is this uh, nice smooth animation uh, thing to show you um, where the window is going to be or where the button is. Because there's an unzero amount of time where you close the window and it's like, oh, where's that button? And this is a nice little breadcrumb that shows you, here's the button right right here, right? Yeah, click it. Uh, and so some sort of visual effect like that would be uh, <laughs> really nice. Uh, to to add on to this to be like poof like I, either it's been killed or or has exploded. Um, Chromite, this Thurlor person is um, a really generous person who has given the Lutcher plugin community a lot. That's who that Thurlor person is. All right, I'm gonna stick that over there. Okay, so I did want to test two. Oh, we tested the decoy dying, but what we didn't test is me dying while the decoy was out and make sure um, that went away. So, oh, actually it's gonna be harder for me to die because I have equipment. There we go. Well, the thing is definitely not showing up anymore, but I was so busy watching myself die I need a macro that just takes off all of my equipment <laughs> for testing. Thanks, little redhead. This is also another place where having a button that, that makes the macro think it saw the message that I died would be, uh, would be better for my death count, if nothing else. Okay. So now I have a quarter of the health, give or take, maybe a third of the health. It'll be a lot easier to test that. Okay, I was wrong. It's harder to test it because uh, I die so fast. There's another death for you to count, little red hen. I like it. <laughs> All right, so if you uh, aren't familiar with it, if you launch the same instance but change the level, then it will fire up a new version of that instance. If you launch the instance at the same level, it'll try to reuse that one uh, where things were already dead. So those three that my deadly decoy had killed before have risen. All right, my decoy's out, I died, it went away. Well, that's interesting though. They kept fighting something. Maybe it doesn't go away when you die. Maybe they're just only wailing on it, so it goes away pretty fast. All right, well, lesson learned. We'll go ahead and undo that. Hello, raiders from Stein. Steen? Stein. Uh, well, let me know. Uh, you are coming in to a plugin development session. Uh, what I was interested in was as a yellow line hunter or as someone who plays with a yellow line hunter, I was really interested to have an on-screen timer showing me how long I had until my deadly decoy blew up so that uh, I could make use of it and, and see there's a long way away from those trolls. I don't think it's safe to go ahead and pull them. I was just doing an experiment that required me to die. So let me get properly dressed here. Uh, so it would be something like this, where I'd want to be like, okay, I'm going to pull about a third of the way through. And, okay. Ideally, they're going to run up and bam. Neat. So that's the idea of this plugin development, was to be able to detect when the decoy goes out and be able to detect when it is defeated by the enemy prematurely, 
uh, and also to tell you how long until it goes boom, and then once it goes boom, hide it. Uh, and then we can start it up again. Yep. And uh, I'm just using uh, Willow Willow because this character was kind of power leveled pretty quickly on Treebeard here and is underpowered when it comes to defeating things. No, don't defeat it. There we go. Awesome. So I could look up and see there was a second or two uh, left on the decoy, uh, and then boom. Uh, so I, I knew I was likely. The other thing I want to do that's uh, not quite ready yet, and we're not going to do today, but hopefully next time, is keep track of how much damage the decoy has received and uh, give us a bar compared to its max health where, like, essentially a morale bar, because that's what, something we're missing as yellow line hunters, is you click on it, there's no morale bar. And I would love to just have another bar right under here, maybe above, somewhere near it, um, that shows how much morale we think it has. One thing we've discovered earlier in the stream was that there were 2,670 morale points for a level 50 decoy. And what I don't know is, what about level 51, level 49, 52? Uh, and if there's just a one-to-one -one relationship level to this, then we can go ahead and always tell you, um, based on the level you were when you summoned out the decoy, just in case you level in the middle of combat, based on the level you were when you summoned out the decoy, how many uh, morale points it should have, how, many, how much damage we've seen it taken, uh, and give you a sense of how much uh, health it has left. And so that's what I would like to work on next time, because... Uh, Really, we've made a lot of progress this time, more than I thought we might. The other thing I really wanted was to be able to do something similar for traps, but it looks like we're just, excuse me, it looks like we're not seeing the combat messages for traps the same way we are for the dead of the decoy. Oh, well. Um, I would really like that route to stop stabbing me. Okay, neat. So, um... I feel like this has been really productive. I've been loving all the chat we've been having about uh, plugin stuff in general. So if there's any, uh, oh, there's a question in chat. I was gonna say, if there are any last uh, questions while we kind of do this wrap up, um, go ahead and just throw them into chat. Uh, you will not be causing any problems. Uh, C for a maniac says, are you a dev? Um, specifically, I think you're asking, do I work for sending some games, which I do not. Uh, I am just a passionate player slash person who loves plugins, and I really love um, communicating that. And so I have this regular stream here, plugging along Tuesdays, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Check your calendar for what that means for you locally. Uh, but uh, where we just do things. And sometimes there's community suggestions, like we've uh, gone in and fixed some bugs with some uh, existing plugins. And sometimes it's just my own personal pet projects, like this Hunter Deadly Decoy Tracker thingamajiggy. Um, where it just like, hey, how long until that thing blows up? And so we, we just do a mix here. And, but I, I definitely do not work for the company. And so um, like if you had problems with the game, we could try the standard, have you tried turning it off and on again? But I have no secret insider knowledge of anything. Uh, okay. Rumpfondle has a plugin question. Hmm. Um, the question is, is there a way to tell information about things like, say, your current critical rating? And to answer that, I would have to actually go back to the documents and say, um, let's look at the gameplay and look at the local player, which has pretty much the, the most information uh, about a character. And mentally, when I think about the local player class, I think if I were Lotro and I was trying to let you make your own raid UI, what are the things you would need to see about your player and other players? Things like your morale, your power, um, negative effects on you, maybe things about your skills and cooldowns, uh, stuff like that. And so that's the kind of thing I would expect to see in here. Oh, uh, about your, uh, information about your pet, if you are a pet having class like Loremaster. Um, anyhow, so those are the things I would mentally think of as likely to be here. Uh, but then extra information like your current critical rating, well, maybe that's there too. And so I would scroll through. So what do we have? Alignment? Oops. Is that like free peoples versus uh, monsters? You got me curious. 
Oh, free people, monster, or yeah. Cool. Um, get attributes. Get the general attributes of a player. All right, what's that? Um, free people attributes. Not a lot there. Where are those? Okay. Anything? Oh, okay. So, um, agility, armor, base agility, base armor, fate, might, resistance, vitality, will. So, your critical rating, um, if there was a base plus you were getting stuff from, say, your agility or your will or whatnot, you might be able to calculate it. I'm not seeing critical here in the freeps. What else? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing these are the things that you can get. Uh, if there's any undocumented functions, those might be in there as well. But I'm not seeing specifically, uh, for your example, of critical rating. So if critical rating is purely calculable based off of other stats like agility or fate, uh, then yes, you could get agility, you could get fate, you could uh, crunch the numbers and spit out a critical rating. Uh, other than that, um, maybe not with this, uh, with this. Baz says, sad, miss the stream. Uh, no, no worries. Uh, like I said, I'm here uh, each Tuesday and you can always, it's less fun, I know, but you can check the replays on Twitch or it'll also be uploaded to YouTube on the Life Beyond the Shire YouTube channel. Um, so feel free. Oh, hello, Gumps. Cool, okay, I've caught up on chat. I'm gonna take a drink. Uh, like I said, if there's any more uh, questions or comments that you wanna uh, trickle on in here in the last couple of minutes, uh, but since it's almost midnight here in the Netherlands, so I think now's a, a pretty good time to, to break for the evening. And then next time we can uh, talk about resizing uh, this window. We can talk about moving this window. Uh, we can talk about um, uh, 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 tracking damage, like we were saying. Uh, in fact, I should write these down. Okay, so to do next time, uh, track damage, make window draggable, make a resizable through options panel. He's stretching that for a lore mentioned. Cool. All right. Yeah, thanks for the raid. I hope uh, if this sounds appealing to you that you check us out again next week. Uh, if not, that's totally okay. Uh, plugins or the uh, development thereof is not for everyone, but uh, thank you for checking us out. Uh, room photo. Yeah, it's uh, totally possible that there are functions that are not in that list. Uh, one of the things that you can see is if you go to uh, the Lotro interface wiki page, there are some attempts to fill in missing information. So if I come into the turbine.ui uh, turbine uh, and I go to the control page, any of these functions that's in red is a function that people have used that it, it is definitely in there, but is not in the official documentation. Um, so the set stretch mode, get stretch mode, these are things that we know work and that we're, we're using set stretch mode right now in this plugin. Uh, and either, you know, it's, it's been discovered by people or it's been trickled out from developers. I'm not sure, I don't know the, the history of those discoveries, but not everything that you can do is in the documentation. That is definitely true. Uh, uh, that is known, it is known. So it is entirely possible that crit is also one of those functions. In fact, hey, well, I'm here. Uh, if we come in into uh, turbine.gameplay and come in into, well, local player, oops, get attributes, type attributes, and we know we were looking at freeps. Okay, lots of stuff. Get. Okay, base, crit. Okay, yeah, crit. Um, there's definitely functions in here for critical hit, chance, and avoidance, for melee and range and tactical. So it is strongly likely that this is in here. Now, what we are not seeing is callbacks to say, please tell us when a specific thing has changed. Um, 
And so there might be a general attributes have changed callback function, and then you just look to see if it's the one you care about. Or you do what we did today, and you have a timer, and once a second you just go and update yours with whatever that value is. Now, performance-wise, that's not optimal, but we really love to use events um, callbacks when we can. But, you know, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? Like uh, an update that is simply going and grabbing that thing and putting it into a label, that's pretty performant. Um, yeah, you know, take it as well. You can even have it check and say, when's the last time I tried to set the label? If it's been more than a second or more than five seconds, go ahead and do the update. Just in case setting the label text is a more expensive operation than comparing two integers, which it is, uh, then you can do the more expensive operation a little bit less often and just do the checking, has it been more than a second? Has it been more than a second or what? whatever? Um, anyway, yeah, so there's lots of stuff here. <laughs> the ruler does point out the other way is true. Not everything that you can do is in the documentation, and not everything in the documentation is actually something that you can do. So um, as we have been doing all night here, uh, experiment, play around, or get your friendly local plugin developer to experiment and play around and just try it and see what the thing happens. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what we did today was just try the thing. Uh, next time we'll, we'll do some refinements on just trying the thing. But today was just trying the thing, and I think it turned out pretty well. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I don't see any. <laughs> Thank you, Dudley Dequin. Uh, um, excellent. Awesome. Well, that's all we're going to cover today, then. Uh, thanks for joining me on this exploration of Lotro plugins. I do hope to see you next week. And until then, uh, keep plugging along. All right, bye-bye now.